We got 31 of you up in here already. All right, nice, all-nighter. Just pulling my kayak from the water now. Great timing, yeah it is. Look how many people up in here, this is so awesome. It's great to see you guys here. Thank you for uh, being so patient and waiting till I got off of work. Uh, I know I put the uh, schedule this live stream about an hour ago and I see that there was like up to like 27 people waiting at one point. That's really cool of you guys to hang out and wait for me to, to start this up. Um, you know, one of the things that I really want to talk about today is the lumber industry and some of the some of the things that I am seeing taking place within the lumber industry that is very similar to what happened back in 2019. Now, something that I found very interesting is that back in 2019, and it's hard to remember what the um, what the people's perceptions were back then. Like you have to go back and actually look at YouTube videos and find you know like articles and stuff like that to find what people were thinking and talking about when it came to the new construction market. Because in 2019, it was in it was not in good shape. That's you know the the simplest way to say it. But uh, had you been following my channel back then, we were talking a lot about mill curtailments, inventory depletions. There was a lot going on within the building industry on the supply side of things when it comes to the lumber industry and supplying that new construction market. Now, if you think about like back in 2019. And some of the reports of mill closures, uh, mill curtailments, the inventory depletions, and then you kind of think about like what happened shortly after that. Now, nobody could have could have predicted some of the things that were going to take place, especially like the government reactions to stuff. But what a lot of people were thinking back then, at least towards the end of 2019, is that there was going to be a housing market crash. And the idea of building a house going into that was not like... Not on the top of people's list of like their their options, you know, like they saw that there was going to be a housing market crash and building a home going into that wasn't going to be smart because you were going to be able to pick up a house cheaper than you'd be able to build one. Like this was kind of the idea back in 2019. But then what ended up happening is the pandemic kicked in and the lockdown started. And uh, although we did see a dramatic slowdown in the housing sales that had taken place and a dramatic slowdown in the new starts that was taking place. What ended up happening after that was quite the opposite of what people were anticipating. Because of the moratorium on, you know, your house payment or rents or anything else like that, nobody was really foreclosed on. And so this is really what caused the house prices to go up because there was a lack of inventory. Not only from the lack of foreclosures that would naturally be in the system, but there was also a lack of new inventory coming from the new construction market because everybody was so concerned about this whole housing market downturn and building a house into like lesser priced homes. I mean, it's kind of what the idea was back then. So what I kind of think about I was like, okay, so back then in 2019, we had come off of like incredibly high lumber prices from 2018. There was a dramatic slowdown within the, the, in the production of lumber, especially up in the British Columbia area. We saw those mill curtailments. We saw the, we saw the inventory slowdown and then we saw the pandemic kicked in. And then shortly after that, we saw the prices of homes really dramatically rise. Okay, so without the pandemic kind of thing, just that timeline, right, where you saw the lumber prices come down dramatically, the inventory depletions, and then shortly after that, we saw a spike in house prices. Well, right now, we are seeing something kind of similar in, in a way, not necessarily the same direction, not for the same reasons, but something very similar inside of like the inventory depletions when it comes to the lumber at, from like the mills through the distribution hubs all the way down to the retailers. There is a huge drop in the amount of inventory out there, very similar to back in 2019. Okay. You know, you kind of you know, think about these similarities that are happening here. So I think about like, well, had you tried to build a house or you started to build a house back at the end of 2019 when everybody says this is a terrible time to build one. If you were actually able to complete that house, you were completing it right into the perfect timing to sell it for the highest price you possibly could have. So you think about it, you have like that whole idea of be fearful when people are greedy and greedy when people are fearful and so right now people are incredibly fear fearful of the whole housing market especially when it comes to new construction i mean i'm in the lumber sales industry i would really know 
But right now, there is a huge pullback in the new construction market, which is not going to be bringing a lot of new inventory of new homes to the housing market for those, you know, for the buyers to buy out there, for the buyers to purchase. And so if you go and you look at the article that I leave down in the description, this is something that has taken place and realtors are talking about it all over, that there is still a tight inventory out there of homes. Yeah, it is starting to rise. Yes, the housing market is slowing down. Sure, there's price drops coming in many directions and in many areas. But considering what we are coming from, the incredible rise that we were on, that the pullback that we are seeing now is still not significant to bring us back to what would even be remotely close to normal. We are still way above that. So these are some of the things that I've been kind of rolling through my head is like, what's going to happen with the new inventory of homes when you have a depletion of inventory in lumber, right? If there's less lumber in the system, there's less material to be, to build homes with. There's less demand for that taking place. And if you have that going on, at some point, you're going to have a demand for new inventory that is not going to be there because nobody's starting homes right now. And so I, I do think about that. It's just like you want to be kind of opposite of the crowd. Well, if everybody's fearful of building a home right now and lumber prices are as cheap as they are and you see mill curtailments and inventory depletions happening at the level they are, right now is your best opportunity to pick up framing lumber than just about any time in the past years and what I'm going to be thinking coming into the future years as the inventory depletion is still taking place. No, think about this. I mean, I forgot how many times have I said inventory depletion? All right. So a lot of you know that I get an email once a week that tells me kind of what's going on throughout the different industries or different uh, regions throughout the industry. And uh, something very interesting that I see inside of this is uh is when it comes to like the OSB market in plywood. Now, OSB is, it stands for oriented strand board. It's the cheaper version of sheathing, like sheathing plywood. So typically when you're building a new construction, you got the skeleton, like the two by fours, the two by sixes, that's like the skeleton of everything. And then you got the skin that goes on the outside, the sheathing. And the cheaper version of this is OSB, oriented strand board. And then you can step it up and into the plywoods, right? So the OSB, and this is what it says here, uh, and this is after like very difficult time trying to bring inventory up to a significant level with OSB. And because that that OSB has been in short supply, it's caused the plywood prices to be elevated. Well, we're finding that to kind of dissipate out now. OSB is coming down to what is considered a much more reasonable price, normal price. And plywood is right behind it as well. So anyway, it seems here, uh, let's see here. OSB seems to be on more solid base this week. Mills have done away with big counters and have pretty well matched supply with demand. So if it seems to me like the OSB market is coming back to what would be considered normal. Now, going over to plywood, a shift in demand is being felt in several mills as supply has now seemingly come down enough to match demand. These mills will continue to firm up prices are more as more interest develops so the plywood has come down dramatically and this is what i'm getting out of a lot of this is that this is the bottom like there is not much more room for downside risk by purchasing lumber at this price and this is what a lot of the suppliers are doing is they're looking at this saying okay well maybe now is my inventory build because if i can build it here at this level then i will actually have something to sell for a profit if the prices go up because the prices probably won't be going much further down from here um Okay, let's see here. Yeah, it says here. Uh, let's, well, let me see. Let me move on. Uh, okay, southern yellow plywood appears to be in the beginning stages of firming up. Right? So it looks like all these plywoods, at least as far as I can tell, have come down to the level in which that this is it. This is as cheap as it's going to be right now. Um, cause after this, they're going to start like, once they have met demand, then they're going to start curtailing development at the demand. If their supply starts increasing over their demand, but right now it seems like they have found that level. Um, all right. S uh, lumber sales of Western SPF were slow as expected through another holiday week. Announcements of extended downtime confirm the fact that there is too much wood in the system. So in inventory levels have reached their reached their peak is what I guess I'm getting at is that this is where you're going to find like the cheapest lumber. And if you have the inventory levels, what did they say inventory? 
uh, confirm the fact that there is too much wood in the system. Too much. That's why you see the prices of futures down at three fifty per thousand or whatever it is right now. Three fifty six, I think, is what it is. All right, Southern Pine. With the start of the new year, we have Southern Yellow Pine Market Firm, two by fours flat and two by sixes in all regions up ten per thousand. Uh, two by eight seen an increase, and two by tens were larger increase as well. So the Southern Pine is not dropping any further. It seems like they are actually found their footing and are actually found a little bit of actual price increases on it. Uh, Western species of dry dimensional. There has been a bit of an uptick in terms of activity this week. The mills that I have been in contact with have reported a sufficient sales week compared to the previous handful of weeks. This was expected given the fresh off the holiday slowdown. Buyers remain conservative overall as most look to keep somewhere between uh, a month's worth of supply. Uh, let's see here. Um, let's see. I am led to believe that we are close to investment levels of 2x4, 2x6, 2x8. There is very little downside associated with these widths so it seems to me like you know that the price of lumber just isn't going to go down much further from here everything that i read everybody i talk to everything i see lumber isn't going to get much cheaper um let's see let's move on see if there's any other good information here uh the green here we go green dug fur remains slow this week uh Quarter one contract volumes have pushed some items out a couple of weeks, but most items are available for next shipment. So yeah, there's like, there's no lack of lumber in the system, right? Right now there is no lack of lumber. And when you had house prices moving up as high as they were because the cost of building a home went up $30,000 just from the framing portion of things, we are seeing that that is not the case right now. And that framing a house is probably going to be as cheap now as it's ever gonna be. Think about that. Like, do you anticipate that lumber could ever get cheaper than 350 per thousand on the futures, considering most mills are not profiting under 500 per thousand? So this is your opportunity, this is it. And after this, I don't know where it is that lumber is gonna go. But when you think about the inventory depletions, the mill curtailments, and at some point there's going to be an uptick in demand, it's going to wipe the inventory out and there's just simply not going to be enough lumber in the system, even though that's not the case today, right? But if they slow down on their production and then all of a sudden there's a pickup in demand, we, are, we could see something very similar to what we had experienced when the lumber ran up to 1700 per thousand, where there just simply wasn't enough inventory in the market to supply the inelastic demand coming from those builders out there. Uh, let's see here. Did I get a super chat? Let's go take a look at that. Where was that? Oh, there it is. Hey, thank you, Robert Shields, for the dollar ninety nine. I really appreciate that. Like you, PP will people will buy when need a roof overhead. Yeah, and it's not just a matter of that. Like I was talking to some real estate agent. I was talking to a real estate agent. I might try and get her onto the show here if I can. She uh, seemed willing to do it. But I was, I was asking her, I was just like, are people nervous out there? And she was like, yeah, people are nervous, but the houses are still selling. And so I think about that. It was just like, when I, when I tried to get like, you know, like the real concern out of her, you know, she didn't really have that major concern. Like, Hey, I'm not going to be able to sell these houses coming into the future. There's buyers who had stepped away from the market when there was too many people in competition. Right. They would come to a house and they would have to compete with seven other offers or whatever. And it was just a nightmare of trying to acquire a house. Well, those people just basically backed away from the market. They're like, I'm not I'm not participating in this with all this competition out here from the, all these buyers. Well, she said that a lot of those people are now calling her back saying, hey, I've been watching some of these houses. Here's a particular house that's been on the market for four months or one that I was looking at has come back on the market. Well, a lot of these buyers are now coming back to her and saying, hey, we're interested in looking at homes again. So that's pretty interesting to think about because most people like backed away from the market saying, hey, I'm not touching this thing until the prices come down. I'm going to stand in here with all the pool of other people who are sitting here waiting for the prices to come down. But a handful of people who didn't like dealing with all the competition are now finding themselves without competition, right? Now all the buyers have backed away. And so they pretty much just out there by themselves looking at these homes and who knows, like 
how far, how much prices will drop, how interested are they in trying to take on that risk, take buy a house now and hope to refinance it in the future. There's all kinds of strategies that people can take on. Nobody knows what's, you know, what exactly to do, but you have a bunch of people who are saying, I'm not buying right now. So when the prices do come down, you're going to be in competition with a ton of other people who are doing the exact same thing by waiting. You know, I couldn't tell you what the right way to go about it is. It's just, that's what I'm seeing out here. Uh, it's good exposure for her. She'd be stupid not to. Oh no, she'll come on. Um, we just need to find the timing to do it. And so, um, what is that first round of waiters stepping in? Still plenty of downward movement. Um, I have sellers reaching out to my agent like crazy. Say, send any offer. Yeah, and well, I mean, you're going to, right? Because as all the buyers are stepping away, waiting, how far down are those prices going to go? I mean, are the buyers going to wait forever? I mean, are there no buyers out there right now? No, there's a couple of them. And then as the prices go down, a couple more will jump up. And then as the prices go down even more, you're going to find even more competition. And then pretty soon you're going to have to be in competition with all a bunch of other people. And then you're going to have to start going into bidding wars again. Right, because how far down can it go before you finally find people who are going to jump? Like everybody's going to wait. They're going to wait for like you know this moment event. Like this is the thing. Unless it's triggered like off of like a moment, like a an attack or you know something happens, the gradual like shifting into cheaper houses. I just don't see that happening. As it slowly starts to get cheaper, then people are going to start jumping into that. They're going to take their opportunity when they can. People don't want to sit around waiting to live in a house. People want to live in a house, right? I mean, I even think about it now. Like, I wanted to wait to purchase the house because I wanted to see what was going to happen after interest rates rise, and I would be able to pick up a house cheaper. Well, that was over a year ago, right? Now, had I waited, the house price has moved up since I purchased it just a year ago, right? Now, granted, it could come down. It could, you know, come down significantly. It would have to come down so damn much from what it is now estimated at in order for me to go underwater that I just don't see it happening. I mean, it would have to be like a significant amount. And if it drops down that much, I'm not going to be terribly worried about the housing market. I'm going to be more worried about the chaos that is happening throughout the rest of the world and probably trying to figure out where it is that I'm going to get food from. But the housing part of things, I'm probably not going to be too worried about. The rent in my area is incredibly expensive, which leaves the payment on my house incredibly affordable to live in so i'm going to hold on to that forever and i'd imagine that a lot of people are going to be doing the same thing especially if they have an interest rate at three and a quarter so now i think about all the people out there who are saying nope there's going to be a housing market crash okay well let's think that again how many people actually purchased homes when there was very little home sales taking place and lack of inventory out there over the last couple of years, two or three years, me being one of these people, right, I'm willing to admit that, who bought at these incredibly high prices? Not a lot. Like, not a lot of homes were sold during that time. Now, what was taking place during that time is everybody who had purchased a home already was refinancing those homes into cheaper interest rates and cheaper payments. And so now you have a whole bunch of people who should have been in going into foreclosures or losing their house for whatever reasons because they, you know, there was the pandemic and they lost their job or whatever happened. All that moratorium, all those foreclosure forbearance things that had taken place got wiped out. That event wiped out the housing market crash. The one that should have taken place that we were all anticipating back towards the end of 2019 got papered over it and covered up. Everybody got bailed out. Think about it. If you t if you were like right on the edge of foreclosure, you're like, man, I don't know if I'm going to be making it. I don't know what I'm going to do here to make my next house payment. And then all of a sudden the pandemic kicked in and you were told you don't have to make your house payment anymore. In fact, here's some stimulus money. Yeah, right? go out and enjoy it. And then as you were wondering what it is that you're going to do as far as coming up with the payments to, to deal with this forbearance, the price of your home shot up dramatically as the lack of inventory provided very few homes out there for people to buy because you're in forbearance and you're not making your payments and you're not getting foreclosed on. So by the end of this, and it's coming time to get out of forbearance, you're thinking, well, why would I go and make all these payments, these past payments on this house, 
when I haven't made a payment on the house and I could just sell this house for a profit right now. And that's what a lot of people did. So even if you were about ready to go into foreclosure, which would provide a lot of inventory onto the into the market, people just simply sold their home. Like they didn't have to make their back payments. They didn't have to do any of that stuff. They just sold it all off and made a profit off of it and probably cleared out some bad debt and was able to move into another place, right? So this is some of the things that had taken place prior to, you know, prior to what we were experiencing now. These, this forbearance really screwed everybody out of being able to get a cheaper home. That's what happened. The pandemic papered it over and screwed everybody out of a chance to get a cheap home. Anyway, let's, let's find some questions here. Something to talk about. Man, so many people up in here. 240 of uh, 245, 69 likes. Hey, in, whether you're liking the chat or not, go hit the stream. Go and hit that like button. We'll get more people up in here to uh, to hit the comment section, which always makes it a lot more fun. All right, buyers will trickle in as rent prices moderate and credit requirements get tighter. They won't all jump at once, like you say. No, the rents are not coming down. Why would rents come down? All right. You got all these people who are waiting to buy a house. They have to live somewhere. They're going to go somewhere where? Rent. They're going to go rent somewhere. And that's the reason why rents aren't coming down right now. You haven't, I mean, they might moderate in some areas, like you're saying, but moderate from 1800 a month for a single bedroom apartment here in Astoria when I'm making $2,200 a month payments on a house and a four bedroom house. I mean, how far would they have to moderate? They would have to go down like 50% for it to be like reasonable, right? I mean, what's what would it take in order for rent to be more affordable than a house payment? All right, how far would rents have to come down? A lot, like, I mean, a whole lot. And I just don't see it happening when everybody is waiting to buy. Like, if you're waiting, you're buying, you're renting, right? All right. Hey, Robert, thank you again for the $1.99. Households 2020, 128 million. 2021, 129 million, 122, 30 million. Um, I'm not sure what that statistics is. Households. Is that how many there are? <laughs> Household formation is on a steep decline. That's what could lead to rent price coming down. The simple truth is that people just can't afford to live anymore they are moving in with family okay um well i could go with that too now if you if you think about like some of the things that are taking place right now with what is happening with the like i said the single bedroom apartment up here okay that's not something that people can afford really and that's what's in demand right now because people aren't family formations right there are no family formations or there's less of it so what are they going to do? I mean, if you are living with family, that is a family formation. So if you moved in with your family, even though you should be moved out, sorry, but that's part of the family, right? Now, if you had roommates or something like that, then that would be a little bit different story. But everybody needs to live somewhere, right? And if you're not living on the street, you're most likely living in an apartment. And if there's a high demand for apartments because people aren't teaming up together to get married and have, you know, have kids or do that, then there's going to be a higher demand for apartments, which is going to keep their rents elevated. You know? I mean, that's how I see it. I don't know. All right, four ninety nine from Brandon Aries. Thank you so much. Best economic channel on YouTube. Well, I appreciate that, man. Thank you very much for the support. Uh, uh, anybody know the reason the West Roman Empire ceased to exist? They accepted barbarians into their territory without building walls. In the end, the barbarians took everything. Point is build walls. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, that's, I mean, that's a... I mean, that's a that's a very uh, creative way to, to think about like what happens during an economic collapse, but it doesn't have anything to do with the invasion of other people or anything like that. It has to do with the flow of money and new money coming into a state. And that's really all it comes down to. Everything else is a consequence of that or a symptom of it. You know, I, I hear people like talk about, well, they're going to allow all these people to come in and then they'll vote themselves into office and then they'll change the way things are. And then the economics will change, too. No. Right. The economics of things were going to continue on the way they are. 
the fact that there was migrants moving in or people leaving or manufacturing coming or going or whatever it is, is the consequence of the economic environment that is happening, right? That stuff wouldn't take place if it wasn't for the economic environment at the time. And so when you look at like even the Roman empires or, you know, any, any empire, anything, any, any rise and fall of a great nation always happened economically, right? I mean, you have war torn wars and stuff like that that were devastating, but they wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for the economy to allow it to take place. And so this is really where I think everybody should try and take on Cantillon's essay on, you know, as far as like the flow of money into a state, because it makes so much sense when you start thinking about it that way. It's not so much like the politics. It's not the, it's not the, you know, the, the condition in which that people are behaving and stuff like that. It doesn't, none of that stuff really matters as much as the flow of money coming in. Because that flow of money is what's giving everybody the opportunity to behave the way they do, right? That's the reason why politicians act the way they do and wars start and all the other things that happen is because of this flow of money and the way it comes in and the way that people handle that flow of money coming in. So if you, if you kind of look at it from that kind of sense that, you know, when you have this new money flowing into a state and what ends up happening with that, with that flow of new, new money coming into the state, then it really starts making sense on why we are in the situation that we are and that there's really nothing that can be done about it. And at some point we're all, we all will fall into poverty if the dollar does not remain dominating or the dominant world reserve currency. I mean, the moment that we lose that status, it is over. It is so over for us. There is nothing that we can do because we don't really have a manufacturing base to provide us with a, any kind of real income. So what ends up happening right now is that we have like a situation in which that we used to be a manufacturing state. Like we used to manufacture and distribute stuff throughout the entire world. And then we lent that money to the world. Now, what ended up happening is, is as that new money was coming in, like we're producing stuff and we're sending it out to the rest of the world and the rest of the world is sending us their money. And as that new money starts coming into the United States, we really started enjoying a higher standard of living because of it. I mean, everybody's sending us their money, right? They're, we produce stuff and they're giving us their, their cash for it. And our, we started, you know, really getting a lot of the world's, uh, world's money from all the manufacturing that we were doing. So as that was happening, the people really started enjoying that higher standard of living. And what they started to do is started to increase the amount of foreign imports because they were cheaper. Like when you start getting a higher standard of living, you get more money. You don't want to spend that money on higher priced goods. You want to spend it on the same priced goods. The only problem is, is that if you are earning more money and you cause the standard of living to rise, you're going to cause everything else as far as the purchasing stuff, the, per the, the items that you, the goods and services that you purchase, all that stuff's going to go up too because of this new money coming into the state. So those people who have access to that new money start searching out the foreign imports. As those foreign imports start to come in, it's competing with the domestic manufacturing, and that domestic manufacturing starts finding its way out. As it's finding its way out, the standard of living that is amongst the lower end of the, at the end of the line, the people who have last access to the money, they're suffering the most with it as their jobs are disappearing, they're, they're, they have last access to the money, so by the time they get it, the prices are moving up, and they find themselves having to leave the area too, in order to find a higher standard of living. So not only do the inhabitants leave, but the manufacturing leaves, and the only thing you have left of the state is the people who have access to the money first, the foreign importers, the people who are bringing that stuff in, the artisans and everybody who is like kind of working for everybody up in there and that who has access to that money. And then you have this huge gap, right, between the people who have and the people who have not. And then the people at the bottom of the line, they're suffering in poverty as they're trying to deal with the fact of all oh, this new money coming in and all the foreign production that's coming in and not the domestic manufacturing to provide them with the standard of living. So they're suffering with it pretty heavily. And then the new money co that's coming in gets cut off and everybody falls into poverty because nobody here is manufacturing. And that is the case that's going to happen here. It's happened throughout history. It's going to happen again. And who knows who the next one's going to end up like, you know, taking over. It's probably going to be China. And I see China actually trying to combat that. Like that's where I think a lot of the whole China COVID lockdown is to try and prevent that manufacturing from happening to, you know, the, it, it, it sounds dumb to say, it, 
right? It just doesn't seem right to say manufacturing a bunch of stuff and exporting it to the world is a bad idea. Like, it does not make sense to say that. But when you think about you're exporting all this stuff and they're sending you the new money, right? You get all this new money coming in and then you think about what the people do with that new money. They go into luxuries. And that is really where the major problem ends up being. See, if they, they took that money and they didn't go into luxuries, like they manufactured, exported that out, took the money, and then reinvested that into more manufacturing or something like that, it would probably continue on just fine, right? Well, it wouldn't be because eventually it would find its peak. But, you know, it would it would do better. But instead, people get that new money and then they dive into luxuries. They want to enjoy their life more. And so this is really where the problem is because as they dive into luxuries, that's where the foreign imports start to come in. Yeah. All right. Would anyone work if money didn't exist? Well, of course they would, you know, because you would have to work for something. And then, like, you know, you would figure it out. Money would end up just naturally occurring as you would have to find something to figure out the barter system with. Like, you could just trade your efforts for somebody else's, you know, efforts or whatever. But most of the time, people are going to find a common thing to trade amongst each other in order to, to facilitate that sort of commerce. And... Yeah, people would work. You, uh, you ever read the book Science of Getting Rich? I haven't. I really should, though. You'll have to work your own... Work for your own food. Yeah, and that's, you know, something else somebody asked me about earlier today. They were saying, hey, do you think that there's going to be a food shortage, food crisis? I absolutely do. I absolutely do, and I think it's going to happen from the rest of to the world demanding food and it's being priced in dollars as the dollar increases with strength with i know a lot of people don't believe that either but the dollar will strengthen at some point as the federal reserve continues in with their quantitative tightening as the food becomes less available for the world they're going to demand it at a higher price and most of it is priced in fact almost all food is priced in dollars and so as you have nations who cannot produce enough food for themselves in high demand for dollars they are going to drive the food prices through the roof as that starts to take place, this is really how I see it happening. As the food prices start to elevate, you're going to find investors wanting to take advantage of that. So they're going to borrow money to buy into farmlands, equipment, everything else. And that's going to continue to drive the prices up even higher. At some point, all that investment going into taking advantage of the high food prices will overproduce food. And then you're going to have a crash of food prices and a bunch of people are going to end up going bankrupt. The, you know, the a lot of commercial farmers or small time farmers or people who have over ex extended themselves on debt are going to find themselves going bankrupt and that's when you're going to find the real food shortages coming in is after that uh, eyes on free lunch yeah all right assembly lines was the 20th century 21st century is it information yeah um God's grace rests no longer on America. Uh -huh. It's tyrant imposed food shortages. It can be. Yeah, it very well could be. Um, you know, you think about like the fact that, you know, Russia doesn't export a lot of the fertilizers and stuff. That's like, it's pretty critical for food production around the world. And Again, like, you know, I think that Russia probably wouldn't be in this environment if it wasn't for the fact that the economy is doing what it's doing right now. We are going to find that at some point we're a collapse of the entire system in a sense that it's going to be rebuilt on a digital platform. And I really think that's what's kind of going on here is that they're trying to and I, I hate using they right. But it really seems that the system is contracting in such a way that they can deplete it down to the minimal and then digitize it, tokenize it, and then build it up from there. I mean, trying to tokenize something on, you know, when you have like this huge amount of effort happen, like, you know, you got all this stuff going on and it's really difficult because it's not like a crisis scenario. So it's, it's hard to get people to get on board with that and it's hard to transition or something. But if you have like a complete diminishing of the system in a crisis situation or something like that everybody's going to jump on board they're going to be like hey man i'm totally down what is it because i'm starving give me my card what is it digital whatever i don't care i'm going to go get me something to eat and at that point there's no resistance like that's that's really where i think a lot of people are going to like miss it because they're anticipating that there's going to be like this fight for digital or something like that it ain't going to be no fight the people are going to beg for it because you know, they're going to be hungry 
All right. Um, good on you all night. Yeah. All night is cool as hell. All right. Fertilizer is easy to make. It is easy to make, right? For an individual, right? Like the individual can take care of themselves if they really know what they're doing. But when you're talking like commercial, when you're talking, you need to like fertilize thousand acres or something like that. This isn't something that you can just go and make. You have to buy, you know, you have to go and find that stuff. I don't know, maybe somebody can make that, but it's not likely. Yeah. Forgive me, I usually don't speak on this, but aren't we already digital? No, we are not already digital. We use a digital we use a digital component for making like transfers of of money from account to account. So I think the difference, like for a lot of people to kind of wrap their heads around is that a lot of people think like when they use their debit card, that's a digital payment, which it sort of is like, you know, you can use your phone to do it. Like, you know, you hover your phone over the little keypad and it'll, you know, make the transaction happen. But the difference is, is that what is taking place there is that a, a bank account is telling another bank account to transfer money to another bank account who's going to another bank account. And at the end of there, there's finally this transfer of money through all these clearing houses that have to happen, right? Now, when it comes to a digital, like a central bank digital currency or a blockchain Bitcoin type of transaction, that the two individuals, like if I take my phone and I hover it over the machine, it takes my money and directly deposits it into the next account. It doesn't go through all these different channels of clearing houses in order to make that payment, you know, in order to facilitate the payment. It goes from my phone directly to another to another phone or account or something like that. And Although that seems like, eh, what the big deal? That isn't no big deal. It is a big deal because the efficiency that comes from that is dramatically better. It's It costs a whole lot less and it's a whole lot faster. So it's not just a matter of like just being a debit card to, you know, a blockchain technology or something like that or a distributed ledger or just whatever, you know, a digital currency. Most people won't notice the difference. Like they're not going to even care. Like. They just don't care. Like, what difference does it make? It's like from my bank account and I make the purchases the same way. And that that's going to be like literally the case for most people is they just won't care and they won't even notice any difference. But the major difference is, is that these digital transfers can then be tracked, right? Very much like your debit card can. But then not only can they be tracked and traced and taxed and all that other stuff, but then this is a digital wallet that is in control or that you are not necessarily 100% in control of. And what I guess I mean by that is that you could have government entities or the IRS or whoever who is looking at your accounts and determining whether or not you are behaving legally or ethically or whatever they want to do. Now that's like a kind of like the social credit score kind of part of things. Then you move it into something that is very difficult to try and wrap your head around. And that is the limitations on this currency. Like, can they, will they let you buy alcohol? Can you buy firearms? Can you make, you know, private purchases with it? Say like black market purchases. These are the things that really start to concern people because now you have lost the ability to just, you know, conduct yourself freely like you can when you have cash in the system. And so that's probably where the major concern starts to come in for a lot of people is that they're not necessarily worried about just making these transfers of payment. Like that's pretty simple, you know, nothing to it, but it's that tracking, tracing, and then controlling of your currency. Like think about it. If they ever went into a time where they wanted to stimulate the economy, they can say, Hey, here's a bunch of money and you have 30 days to spend it, or you're going to lose it. And you're going to have to spend it on either food, gasoline, uh, you know, medical, something like that, but you won't be able to spend it on beer, weed, firearms, good time, whatever, you know, you won't be able to do any of that stuff with it. And this is like one of the, this is like the major concerns that come from a lot of people with the digital, you know, like not wanting to be part of any kind of digital, digital currency system. Now, I personally don't think any of that stuff is going to happen in when they introduce this stuff. In fact, it's going to be like so casual for people to use it and not a big deal for for everybody like even black market trades or drug trades and stuff like that 
they're going to make it so that people are not worried about it because the number one thing in having a currency is you have to have confidence behind it. And if everybody's worried about whether or not they're going to be tracked and traced and taxed and, you know, lose control over whether or not they can make purchases and stuff, they're going to do whatever they can to try and avoid that currency, that digital currency. But if it's just as simple and easy as using cash and nobody gets in trouble for it, everybody's going to use it. And once you get a generation of people who are just don't know any other way, you, you got them locked. They're done. They are, they are locked into that system and there is no way of backing out. Unless you teach them, you know, you better load up on gold and silver and have that ready. All right. People wake up. You can't own property. It's not yours. You do not possess an allodial title. All you have is the deed, and that is just another form of rent you are leasing from the state with a deed. Yeah, that's true. And, you know, but you also get the opportunity to sell that piece of property for a profit. So, I mean, yeah, you're right. You don't actually own it, but, you know, you own the, the rights to the profit of it if you can. All right. No, they say you can only spend it on the bad stuff. They say you can't spend it on food except if it's bug special okay hey jaws thank you very much for the dollar 99 really appreciate it it's good to see you here and another dollar 99 for me man he made it all right thank you uh let's say people on the sidelines rack up massive amounts of credit card debt would that affect them getting a home debt is easy to get into a hole fast yeah um i don't know i mean i guess that would be like an individual like you know circumstantial thing you know somebody was like trying to tell me about how like there's going to be all this inventory coming onto the housing market and he used an example like i guess like a member of his family or something was going through a divorce and he says so they don't have any other choice they're gonna to have to put that house up on the market and i'm like well yeah that's like you know one one circumstantial you know case that's not like a general view like not all these people are like i mean i'm sure a bunch of people are going to get divorced but you're not going to find a huge inventory rise of homes because of divorces like i mean <laughs> you might i mean but that's not like something that you would typically think of would would, would be the case you right you know you want to see like inventory rise like as far as real estate goes from like unemployment like if unemployment rises dramatically and people aren't able to make their payments or rent payment or house payment or something like that, then yeah, I would definitely say that that would be the case that to see like a housing market downturn, but it's broad, right? It's the, it's like everybody, it's not just divorces or, you know, somebody losing, you know, access to a, to a trust fund or something like that. I mean, this is where I kind of getting at is that it has to be like, in my opinion, it has to be like a general, like a broad, broad idea that's going to bring the whole market down. That's why I try and cover, like, I look at it from every angle I can. You know, you think about it. When house, people said it over and over again. Once the interest rates rise, you're going to find an immediate crash of the housing market. It didn't crash immediately, right? People said when the forbearance ends, you're going to see an immediate crash of the housing market because people aren't going to be able to come off of forbearance. Didn't happen, right? Um, you know, you hear it constantly, all these reasons that you're going to see this housing market crash. But yet, very few people come up with any kind of real, like, legitimate reason why there would be a housing market crash the only one that i can see and that i keep trying to say and people say you don't i don't bring this up or something is unemployment like unemployment needs to rise in order for there to be a housing market crash so if everybody's waiting for unemployment to rise to get their house then so be it but they're not going to have a job to buy a house with so you know i hope you're sitting pretty you know that you could be able to buy a house when there's no jobs available the job losses have started. You have seen some of the largest corporations across multiple industries starting to lay. Uh, they do not do larger layoffs anymore. They do waves. Yeah, and you know, this is something that I had said was gonna take place quite a while ago. And that the Federal Reserve was trying to kill the jobs, you know, kill that kill that employment out there. You had far more job opportunities, openings out there than there was available workers. Think about how many layoffs you can have before you actually start seeing a rise in unemployment. Yeah, those layoff numbers are huge and we knew that it was gonna happen. We knew that these corporations were gonna start coming into some issues once the interest rates started to rise. And right now, I feel that the Federal Reserve is trying to knock the heads off these zombie corporations and you're gonna start finding a bunch more of them failing. When those guys fail, 
the talented employment is going to go over to the other viable corporations and find their you know find their positions there everybody who got jobs that really shouldn't have are going to find themselves completely lost on what it is that they are going to do to try and find those high paying jobs at those corporations again because they are hiring people that they really shouldn't just to have warm bodies to 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 fill in for the fact that they had acquired so much cash from the low interest rates and the selling of that debt like god there's so much going on here okay so during the pandemic there was a huge dropping of interest rates as those interest rates came down the fixed income investors were looking for a place to put their money so they could get any kind of return and in order to get that return they had to go out higher on the risk scale which means that they had to go into corporate debt so junk bonds became very popular during the pandemic to try and find that fixed income of at least a decent yield that started driving the yields down and the prices up on these bonds so these corporations were able to borrow incredibly cheap during the pandemic as these fixed income investors were finding any place that they could go to to try and find that like that return on it well now here it is the interest rates have moved up these corporations who had taken on a lot of debt you know during the pandemic when they had the options to take out this low interest rate debt they borrowed a lot of this money, spent it, like, you know, expanding their companies or whatever, because there was all this overwhelming consumer demand happening at the time. So they expanded their companies. That means equipment, buildings, and hiring a lot of people. So they hired people up that really probably should never have been hired in the first place. And this is where I think a lot of these zombie corporations are going to start finding themselves in a very tight spot as they are going to have to lay off a bunch of people that they shouldn't have hired. And then they're going to find that they're in a condition in which that the federal reserve has basically said you're not going to get any customers because that's who we're trying to kill and they're going to end up losing that that company anyway so this is how the federal reserve i really felt had conditioned this economy to handle the fact that we were going to have a rise in unemployment like you think about it during a recession what's the worst part unemployment rises and they bail out corporations that has been taken care of like the rising of unemployment right now is not happening, even though you have all these layoffs happening. It will eventually start to pick up. But at this point, it's not happening yet. Right? And this is where the Federal Reserve wanted it to be. They wanted to be able to see that there was zombie corporations getting their heads knocked off, but yet the unemployment doesn't rise because there were so many job availabilities out there. Where are we sitting right now? How much can you actually lay off before you start to see the rise in unemployment? You're going to lay off a lot of people, a lot of them. Yeah. It's like, think about what the Federal Reserve is mandated to do, right? Low and stable prices of 2% inflation over time, whatever that means, and full employment. Now, what are they going to do, right? They're trying to bring that inflation down, but they can't screw up the employment thing, right? Because they're mandated to keep full employment going. So if you have a situation in which that there was way, way too many jobs available out there, well, now you can kick the in interest rates up. You can start knocking the heads off these zombie corporations. They can start laying off a bunch of people as they start to fail or whatever. And they don't have a rise in unemployment because there were so many jobs available prior to that taking place. I mean, it's very... How they were able to do this is beyond me. I mean, this took some serious calculations and planning to, in order to make it happen. You know, but you think about it. Without that pandemic and the special purpose vehicles, the unusual and exigent circumstance none of this would be happening right now, right? We would be in a full-blown economic collapse crisis. This environment would not be anything like it is. But thankfully for the Federal Reserve, they, they're, they're thankful that there was a pandemic and that unusual and exigent circumstance. And they were able to set up the special purpose vehicles, which typically would not ever be allowed from the Federal Reserve. It would not be a tool that they could use. And they use those special purpose vehicles to bail out the entire country. The, the homeowners, the corporations, the government, everybody got bailed out. Everybody got bailed out during the pandemic. And right now we're going into a slowdown and those who were smart about it and held on to the security of that bailout, they're going to do just fine through this. But everybody who decided that they were going to go massively into debt and spend all that money, you're about ready to suffer. Did I just see a huge one? Wow, Jaws, thank you so much, man. One year sober tomorrow. Yes, bro. Oh, man, that is exciting. Can't thank you enough for your sharing your journey through sobriety. Life smacked me in the face once. I sobered up and I didn't have any support except what you share. 
and my determination to do better for myself. Thanks, Simon. Well, thank you, Jaws, man. You wouldn't believe... You wouldn't believe how awesome that makes me feel right now to hear you made it, dude. Made it that year. It is... I was talking with a friend about it earlier today. You know, it changed my life. It took forever for, like, sobriety to actually start proving itself to be beneficial. Because it didn't seem like my life was getting any better. But it, it, it was. I, I mean, everything that I was thinking was changing. And then my life conditioning, everything about it started becoming a better, better place for me. And so, dude, that's awesome, man. You, you know, that is so awesome you did it. And, um, you know, I look forward to hearing, you know, hearing more about your successes in life, man. That is so cool. All right. Robert Shields, thank you very much for the nine ninety nine. Uh, to clarify, new household formation runs about one million a year. New construction average about one point two million a year. We all need roof over our heads. Bottom line, families will buy when they have to. Also, wages to increase. Yeah, it's you know it's going to be really interesting to see what happens with the inventory levels because you know really like during the great financial crisis there was a huge buildup, like a huge inventory build up everybody was building new new homes and then when the toxic assets really started presenting themselves as people quit making their payments on their house because they really shouldn't have had these loans to begin with there was a lot of stuff in the, in the inventory as far as like partially built homes unoccupied homes i mean it was like there was a lot of inventory out there in fact i remember watching videos of them bulldozing houses down like in like almost completed houses and i was just like what in the world is happening you know? so, uh life changing and getting better is like economics it's a slow evolving process yeah you know and that's that's just really it man um you know i look back on some of the times that you know i i was drinking and like i don't want to like say something of like i wish i had never drank or something like that in my life i really enjoyed some of the times that i had you know like hanging out with friends and doing things like that but it was the alcohol-based consciousness that i was in you know like every day you drink well every day your mind is occupied with that and it's swimming with you know depressive thoughts and reasonings why you're not making it and all kinds of stuff. And the last thing that you want to deal with is a bunch of that pain and misery from it. So you crack another beer to get rid of all that stuff. It turns into the cycle of like continuing depression, drinking, trying to just cover it all up. Getting out of that is hard, you know? And then once you do, you have to realize that, man, you know, I had a bunch of mental issues that I was trying to cover up with alcohol, and then you have to go and deal with those. So if you didn't have that to begin with before you went in, which most people, I mean, I'm not saying anything about you, Jazz, but I mean, like for me and like a lot of the people that I know, you already had like some something going on, and then you were trying to cover it up with the alcohol, and then you realize after the alcohol is gone, it's just like, damn, I really do. This is what everybody was talking about, and this is what I have to deal with. So... I mean, that part is pretty hard and a lot of people can't. And that's where, where I think like the rooms and counseling really helps because then you start hearing and talking to people who have actually experienced a lot of what you are feeling and thinking about. And then you realize, oh, okay, so I'm not on my own. And then, you know, you start working through some of those problems. But drinking can be, it's a difficult thing. It drags you down, man. I'm on, let's see, the mind is the most important thing. Alcohol kills it. Yeah. Yes, I just don't drink when I recognize the desire is from stress. Yeah, and that's, you know, that's really where I think a lot of people just don't know how to make that that call, you know, because it's really the stress that's getting them to do it. So, you know, being able to have that sort of willpower within it to say, man, I'm not going to do this because I'm stressed. You know, I'm going to figure out, you know, med go meditate or do whatever you need to do in order to figure it out. But that's where I think a lot of people can't do it. They They lose that, Yeah. Um, just man, you keep <laughs> you keep loading me up, man. Thank you so much. Back to the family time. One more for good measures. Thank you. Well, thank you, Jaws. Yeah, enjoy your family. Enjoy, enjoy that birthday, man. You know, um, in, enjoy it, and and you know, think about it, man. It's been a year, and 
although it was probably a struggle at many times, you know, this is a hell of a reward, man. I mean, it's it's a great feeling of accomplishment to be able to go that many days and to say, I've done it, right? You know, so, you know, the family time is going to be that much more enjoyable. And, you know, everything is going to start being better. It's like a lot like kind of being out of debt, you know, all of a sudden everything that starts, you know, this, the music sounds better, the coffee smells and tastes better, you know, the family time is better. You know, it's it, things start really start doing it for you. You know, enjoy the family time, bro. Uh, let's see here. Glad you make it through econom, or glad you make it through economist. There is so much wisdom in that your audience needs can't be clouded by distractions. Yeah, that's so true. All right. Uh, hey, UE, did you see Canada banned foreign purchases of real estate? Where do you think all those buyers going to go? USA. Now we have more competition and even less supply. Um, yeah, you know, I did see that up there, um, that article. And I was just kind of wondering, like, where is it? Because, like, you know, unless you plan on living, you know, in that country, what is the point of buying buying property or houses or real estate in another land if, unless you're like investing in that? All right. So I could see like foreign investment being banned, but then I could also see like investment companies buying property that foreign investments can get into. So this is like is it really like banning foreign ownership of the property outright or is it going to ban foreign investment going in because that may not stop the foreign investment i mean it might stop the foreign ownership like you know like you can't own this property outright but can it really stop people from investing into the real estate that's that i think that would probably be the bigger question all right uh let's see here your wife and kids will let you know how great you are without alcohol, too. Yeah, that's for sure. Do you think Bed Bath & Beyond could go bankrupt? Difference between Chapter 7 and 11 could speak on... I, I To be honest with you, I don't know enough about, about you know, Bed Bath & Beyond to kind of give you any other opinion other than, like, some of the stuff that I'm reading in the news on it. Um, it's not a surprise. I'm not really, like... I don't really focus in too much on any individual one company, um, maybe on industries, but I look more towards like what's going to happen once the interest rates are going to rise and then how many corporations are going to fail. Like, you know, I mean, you could try and pick out the individual ones. So for like investment purchases, you know, purposes, like, you know, you, you want to do it that way. I, I don't really look at it for an investment purpose of it. I just kind of look at it to see which way the macroeconomic environment is going to head towards. I'm looking for unemployment. So corporations failing would be a rise in unemployment. Those are the, some of the things that I'm looking towards. But, you know, a lot of people look towards this information for investment purposes. And I, I don't like that's not the that's not what I do. And I think that if I did, then I wouldn't I wouldn't be able to like really look at the economy the same way because you're looking at things that are that you're hoping are going to go up and so therefore you're channeling your ideas into that i'm not i don't really care like which way it goes and so i'm not really looking for information that is going to confirm a particular investment of mine i just don't do it you know um so again like studying the economy is more about the direction of interest rates or you know something like that what it's going to do for the behavior of the consumer and you know, what that has the overall impact on the economy. All right, Simon is big picture macro. Yeah, I really am. Is like the it, it's it's hard from a working class point of view to try and see that big picture. Um, you know, when you're talking to like you know like Peter Schiff or you know George Gammon or something like that, these guys they're looking at the economy from a an incredible incredibly elevated view like they see things much differently than i see them you know i'm standing on the ground and i hear some information you know about you know housing market sales being down well i don't go to look for statistics i go and talk to all the real estate agents i know like you know hey what do you know what are you hearing what are you finding out there you know i'm 
in communication with a lot of people who are across the country. And so I get information from a lot of individuals who are just telling me their anecdotal evidence that they are seeing and stuff. Well, when you look at it that way, you get a more of a real, like, it's not, sometimes it's obscured, but for the most part, you're getting a more real time information. You know exactly what's happening like right now. When you see a lot of information, especially when it comes from some of the higher ups or some of those people who have like these elevated views, they're compiling information that has already taken place. And then they put that together to say, this is what I see happening or is going to happen. I'm, I'm different from that. I take some of that information that I see like that. And then I try to find that in reality out there like you know try to find evidence of it with the people that i that i work with or the people that i know or to communicate with and then i try to find those particular things because that gives me more of like a real like time understanding of what is happening like once you wait for the information to come out and you start finding it on youtube and stuff it's already happened it's too late like you know you're already behind the curve i mean even in my videos even if i was to say something like you know, I just experienced this thing today, right? I mean, by the time you're hearing it, it's already too late. It's already out there. The information is already existing. So trying to be as up to date with information as quickly as possible means that you really can't wait for the data to come out. You have to present that anecdotal evidence and then hope that, you know, that you're right. Right? You know, and I mean, that's where I study as much as I can to try and confirm it with some of the stuff that I that I see out there, especially when I'm talking with like the the wholesalers and mills and some of the other retailers and vendors and stuff. Man, I get a much clearer view of what's happening out there than if I was to try and like, say, like, look at a chart of home builders to see where, you know, where their stock is or something like that. I mean, to me, that doesn't give me good information at all. All right, strip clubs are hurting. Yeah, you can see it. You can see, like, some of the oddest stuff. Like, strip clubs is a pretty reasonable one, in my opinion. It's just like, if you got, you know, extra money in here and you're whatever, you're going to go and spend it there. I mean, or you can spend it there. I mean, it would be, like, a likely place to dump money. But, uh, you know, the other thing is, it's like, you can see some other stuff. Like, where men end up spending money, right? They stop spending it at the strip club and then they stop buying underwear. That's another weird one to look at. Men's underwear, right? When you see men's underwear slowing down in sales, that's an indicator of a, of a recession coming. Like strip clubs and underwear. Huh, weird. <laughs> um, I feel like there's so much pent up demand for affordable homes that there won't really be a crash more so an affordability adjustment it's exactly right man and that's what i'm finding out there as i'm you know talking with people who are looking to get into real estate there are so many people who are just standing there waiting they're not they're like i'm not gonna buy i'm waiting for the house prices to come down and i'm thinking what are you gonna do like so is that person and that person and that person and that person over there and they're all waiting for this housing market to come down so you all gonna go running over to your real estate agent on the same day or what? Man? <laughs> I mean, how is that going to be? How much fun is that going to be like? Gold is basically the same price as it was 10 years ago. Peter Schiff have been missing out for his clients for the last 10 years. Now, I don't necessarily agree with that. There is plenty of opportunities to have made gold over the last couple of years. Now, granted, had you purchased it just, you know, one time 10 years ago and you're comparing it to today, yeah, you're right. I mean, that wasn't a very probably a very good deal. And if you're in a case like me where you actually purchased like during the old time highs during 2011 because you thought for sure that there was gonna be this total dollar destruction and that hyperinflation was, a, was an inevitable, an, an inevitability, but it turned out to be wrong, right? And so I, here I was purchasing silver at 40, 40, I think it was forty dollars an ounce is like I bought one ounce at that height. Um, I bought some like you know I don't know some of it down in like thirties, but I bought a whole lot of it between twenty five and thirty dollars, like a lot of silver I was dumping in at that time. And I mean, how long do I have to wait? That was two thousand eleven. I mean, I have never, never, never ever had an opportunity since then to get my money back out of silver. Not once. 
2011 was the only time there was a very short period of time that I could have got all my money back out of the silver and actually profited some off of it. Right now, I couldn't do it, you know, but having silver is awesome for the insurance policy that it really is. Because if you have something that's outside of the banking system, outside of that third party claim, then you're the only one who's protecting it. You don't have to worry about whether or not the phone, if somebody answers the phone or if the app turns on or if you can log in or something like that. You know, think about all those crypto investors who lost their ass because they didn't have the physical possession of it. That's the problem with anything else out there other than gold and silver and maybe on a lesser extent, something like Bitcoin. But for the most part, if you don't hold it, if you don't own the actual physical item or the private keys in a cryptocurrency situation, you're simply, you don't. You, you're, you're subject to somebody else's, you know, whether or not they decide to give it to you. And that is no place that I would want to be. Silver and gold is the only thing that really protects you from something like that. And, you know, I mean, I know people who have dumped everything that they own into silver. And that isn't, in my opinion, the smartest way to go about things. Simply because of, like I said, I have never been able to get my money back out of silver. But when I had a broken down car and I needed to get to work, I was able to trade 165 ounces for, for a Tahoe. And I tell you, that was pretty cool to have that available to me. So, you know, what are you going to do out there when it comes to investments? I mean, if you're going to invest into the precious metals, like you want to do an investment where you want to actually get a return, it's probably going to be in the miners. Like that's probably where you want to go if you want an actual return on your investment. But if you're looking for security from it, like to protect yourself from the dollar or from, you know, those third-party claims or something like that, physical is the only way you can do it. And you're going to have to pay a price for it. You're not going to, you're not going to get the premium back out of it or whatever. I mean, you just have to kind of understand that and know that that's not the reason why you're purchasing it. You're not purchasing it for the money. You're purchasing it for how many you have. Like, that's it. And the more you have, the bigger the insurance policy. Uh, let's see here. Loved your video on the dollar taking a while to die. Brent Johnson milkshake theory. Yeah. And you know, and that's. And that's the other thing, like, you know, when it comes to a lot of theories, a lot of people have some really good theories about what's going to happen. I mean, there's, there's no doubt about it. There's some, definitely some people who have put it together. But when I look out there and I start finding evidence of particular theories, like Brent Johnson's milkshake theory, when I heard that, I'm thinking, oh man, this makes a lot of sense. Like this I get right and if you're not familiar with brent johnson's milkshake theory it's basically as the dollar strengthens then it starts causing the rest of the world's currency to weaken and then you have like let me see let me let me see if i can explain it the way he does it so easily uh when you're building the milkshake it's like when a quantitative easing is happening and everybody is adding to the milkshake right well then at some point the Federal Reserve switches and they turn into quantitative tightening and it's like sticking a straw into the milkshake and sucking it out. And now that's the analogy he uses for the dollar milkshake theory. You combine that with, you know, Jeff Snyder's, you know, Euro dollar and you start talking about some of the contracts that are written outside of the United States. These are contracts that are due in dollars. These have nothing to do with the United States, not our government, not our banking system, not our corporations, not the people, nothing, right? But yet, these are contracts that are due in dollars, United States dollars. And these contracts are written and then traded as if they are dollars themselves. So think about how much currency gets added to the world reserve currency when you have contracts that are written in dollars and then gets used as if they are dollars. Right? That's a lot, of, a lot of currency out there in the system. So when people want to get out of this, this whole like dollar denominated system, they want out of the dollars altogether. And this is something that I get a lot of people questioning me about. They're like, dude, you obviously don't know nothing about the BRICS nations, right? I know Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. Okay. I'm well aware of this. This has been going on for 15 years or better, you know, from the first time I've ever heard about the BRICS nations. They have been setting up this system for a very long very long time. Will it take over? I don't know. Maybe. Maybe. I don't know. Like, I mean, it's a possibility. But they're not even remotely close. Not even remotely close to doing what the dollar can do right now. 
And there's the major problem that is going to come from some other nation or some other currency trying to take over as the world reserve currency. Now, if you had gold, okay, if gold was the world reserve currency, then that would be something. Like we could go from a fiat currency to a gold standard. Gold is easily recognizable. Everybody knows what it is. It has a particular weight to it, so we can't really change the value. It just is what it is. And it's everybody like who studies economics can understand how gold can be used as a world reserve currency. It's pretty simple. Now, if you want to use a fiat currency for a world reserve currency, there is something very different that needs to take place. Number one, you have to have a debt market as big as the United States Treasury. That is not something a lot of countries are willing to do. If you are willing to take on as much debt as the United States is in order to produce the safe and liquid assets like the U.S. Treasuries in order for the world to have a collateral like that, I would love to see the, I would love to see a nation try. There is no nation out there that is willing to take on that kind of debt, right? Except for the United States because of the way we have our structure and banking system and having the world reserve currency. So that's number one. There's no nation that's going to do that. Not like the United States. So chances of like some other nation being able to build up a debt market like that? No, I don't think so. Right? Not, not today, not tomorrow, not next year. Right Now, could it eventually happen? Sure. The other thing is, is that you also have to provide the world with the dollars. Now, this is really where it gets very difficult to try and wrap your head around because most nations don't want to go into a deficit trade like the United States is, where you import more than you export. Because if you import more than you export, when you import, you are giving the dollars back out to the rest of the world. And this is the easiest way to get those dollars out there to the rest of the world. So you have to have a debt market as big as the U.S. Treasuries. No nation wants to do that or willing to do it or even come close to even attempting to do it, even if they wanted to. Right. So there's no nation that's going to do that. And then the other thing is, is like you've got to find a nation that's willing to take on as much foreign imports to distribute the dollars that the world needs to have it as a world reserve currency. No other nation is willing to do that either. So anybody who says, I don't know nothing about the BRICS nation or how this works or that the dollar is going to lose its world dominating world reserve currency status, whatever, argue that, right? Argue those two things and I will figure it you know, I will change my tone on whatever. So unless we go back to a gold standard or some other nation is willing to take on a debt market as big as the United States is, the United States is it. The, the dollar is it. So if it's not going to be the dollar, we're going to have to have a total market crash, like total currency collapse of everything. And I don't want to leave. I don't want to be there. Like, I mean, I don't know. Maybe I do. But I, I don't I don't wish upon that, you know. All right. Pure gold, 10K, 24K at best. It's only 58% return. All right. Buy low, sell high. Wait until they get a load of my shenanigans. <laughs> These guys are all talking here. All right. um, have you considered interviewing any appraisers from a large metropolitan area? Hey, that would be a good idea. If there's any, if there's any appraisers out there, because that's, I, I know a couple of guys. I wonder if I can get a, get there. That's a good one. If there's any appraisers out there, I would love to, for them to send me an email if they want to come on the channel. Otherwise, I'll try and find some. Because that's a that's a good one. That's a really good uh, that's a really good interview to have right now. Um, I didn't I didn't consider that. So, hockey cards were up six percent in 2022. Hockey cards. Jeez. Yeah, I got in a bunch of old baseball cards from like eighty nine to ninety one. Yeah, eighty nine to ninety one. That's when I was like really heavily into baseball cards. I bought a lot of them. I have like a tote full of these things. All right. Uh, BIS could absolutely unilaterally force the conversion of francs especially as consolatory act between a weakening EU and strengthening BRICS. Okay. Yeah, uh, I mean, I'm not, <laughs> you know, I'm not trying to say that it's not going to happen. All I'm trying to say is, is that I don't see anything out there that's showing the evidence of a major takeover like that. Like, you know, is it, I mean, if you're banking on, like, I'm going to go ahead and start doing my investments to see 
to be prepared for when the BRICS take over as the dominating world reserve currency status and all the other stuff that goes with it. Like, if you're preparing for that now, how are you doing that? Like, how, how does that work? You know, because there's no guarantee that that's going to happen. So you're taking a hell of a shot in the dark. And I'm not even sure. How do you invest in that? You know, <laughs> Other than to say, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to participate in anything else. You know, I mean, I guess that's one way. It's inv it's easy investing in the ESG. Yeah. Everything was up in 2022. I've been buying rupees for years. Peter Schiff has larger concerns in the coming year. Yeah. yeah, and again, like, you know, we're coming to a point in which that there's going to be a shift over into digital currencies. Like, what that's going to look like, I couldn't tell you. I mean, it's going to be very difficult to try and get people to just use it. Right. So most likely it's going to come with some sort of crisis of, uh, or a crash or something of some sort. Otherwise, people really wouldn't get involved with it. So I, I can't imagine it being like an easy transition on something like that. It's probably going to come from a crisis situation. And I can see it happening with a food crisis. Like if food was so expensive that the average person ends up spending like 50 percent of their income on food, they will riot. They will flip out and start destroying their capital and everything else around them. So when you start pushing people to that point, well, then you can start making some serious changes, you know, because they're going to be demanding. All right. Bond market doesn't think Powell will go to five. If power goes past, if Powell goes past five, I think that's the start of the crisis. Well, um, Okay, I don't mean any offense, higher, hi there, guys TV, but Powell doesn't make decisions on any of that stuff. It's the FOMC that does it. Powell is merely a spokesperson for the FOMC. So if you're poking fun at Powell himself, you're you're really you're screaming at a messenger right there. That's not the person. You're not don't look at Powell. He is just nothing more than words. What you want to look at is the FOMC, the Federal Open Market Committee. This is where the decisions are really made. This is like, you know, 12 men and women who have gotten together who decide basically the entire monetary policy of the entire world. So when you look at when you look at these articles or if you point your finger at Powell and go like that moron or whatever, you're you're not po you're pointing you're like you're not pointing at anything. You're po pointing at a at nothing, right? Because that isn't anything. He's nothing more than a voice. I mean, he does have a vote, right? You know, but there's 12 other people who sit on the FOMC. That's where the real focus should be on listening to those guys, listening to what they have to say, figuring out what their ideas and what they are feeling is coming from the future. Read their speeches. Read their blogs. You know, once you start figuring out their kind of idea stuff, Powell, he. He is the establisher of credible threats, okay? So when the Federal Reserve wants the market to start behaving in a particular fashion, then they will put out these statements, right? They will put out the forward guidance. They will say, hey, we're going to lift interest rates by three quarters of a percentage point until whatever, and until we decide that we're not going to do it anymore. And then the market says, oh, shit, we better do something about this. And then they start conditioning themselves to be ready for that three quarters of a percentage point increase. That's what Powell's job was for, right? That's it. Other than that, the, the, the chairman of the, of the federal, of the federal reserve, right? They typically would not speak a whole lot. I mean, think about Alan Greenspan. When he came out and said anything, he was so confusing that most people had to, like, you know, try and interpret what the hell he had just said. And it was very difficult to try and understand what the Federal Reserve was trying to do. They kept themselves very quiet, very silent, and then, you know, after these meetings, make these policy changes. Well, now it's much different. Like, they don't, they don't sit in secrecy trying to, you know keep hidden from the market what it is that they plan on doing. They're straight up telling them, hey, we're going to do this. So go out there and behave in a way that you're prepared for us to do this. And that's that's where, that's the only job of Jerome Powell. That's it. Like he does not make decisions on anything else other than having that vote, you know, that one vote. All right. Um, 
many poor people are getting hurt now. Yeah, it's, you know, this is the thing. I, I, I don't mean to be like, like they should do harder or work harder or something like that. But there is so many opportunities right now to make money. I don't understand why more people don't do it. Like, I talk to a lot of people and I tell them like, you know, hey man, I do a lot of, you know, I do a lot of stuff. I do, I call bingo on Sundays. I do like, you know, my regular day job. I got this, this YouTube thing going. Sometimes I'll go and help out somebody who's, you know, needing, you know, want to pay me for a few hours of work or something like that. Like I try to find work just about wherever it is. And if I'm not actually working and I'm not hanging out with my family, which is something that, you know, I've had to mentally change because I would hang out with my family and then think about videos and that wasn't right, you know? So if I'm not hanging out with the family or I'm not in the actual act of making money, then I'm thinking about making money. I mean, it's sad to, for a lot of people out there. It's like, man, don't you have anything else going on with your life other than the idea of making money? No, I was so broke. I was such in bad shape. I was so like lost on what it is that I was going to do that the moment that I switched the idea of like being broke to getting paid, I don't want to go back. Like, I don't want to go back to being broke again. I like being able to pay bills whenever I, whenever they come. Like it, there was a time when I used to put bills on top of the other bills and just wait until the collection agency got them or something. I mean, it was, it was tough living that way. But I don't, I don't do that anymore. So, yeah, everything is about the pursuing of money. And if you don't have enough of it, you need to go out there and figure it out. If you're working a job that doesn't pay enough, then you need to find a better job. Like, I, you know, people say, like, I don't have a degree. I don't have any skills. I don't have anything out there. You know what? Learn sales. Anybody can do sales. It's just practice. You've got to be good at it. And once you are, get a job in, you know, making commissions. And the sky's your limit. Like, you can make as much money as you want if you have a commission-based job. It's difficult. You have to hustle. You have to really push it. But you can make a lot of money doing that. Now, if you really want to make it rich, like you want to make it like beyond rich, like you can't have a nine to five job. It's not going to work. You can't work for somebody else. It doesn't matter how much money you earn. It doesn't matter how many hours you work in a day. There's not enough. There's not enough hours and there's not enough money in the hourly wage. It's just not going to happen. So what you end up having to do is you have to find something that's going to pay you while you sleep. So that's where like things like a YouTube video work out really well. Rental incomes is great. Dividend paying stocks can do it. There's all kinds of ways that you can put your money towards something or efforts towards something that is then going to pay you back after you've put in that effort. What you are looking for is something that's going to pay you while you are sleeping. And if you can do that and push that even further, then that's really where the money is going to come from. But people who are like, man, I, I mean, I can't make enough on my hourly wage to, to earn a decent living. You never will. Never, ever will you ever have a job that will pay you enough. Ever. Like, I don't know anybody who does. I mean, unless you're like... You know, I don't know, just really disciplined and you're, you know, longshoreman or something like that and you're making a ton of money and you're able to save it. Maybe if you're in that kind of case. But most people aren't. Most people are like living paycheck to paycheck. They have no way of figuring out how they're going to earn any extra money. And, you know, the idea of getting ahead is such a far off concept that they will never even attempt to do it. But right now, there's more opportunity than there ever was. Like, I mean, it just blows me away how a friend of mine, she said that she came into town to drop her kid off for a class and ran a door dash for 10 bucks, right? Paid for the gas money to come into town to drop her kid off for the class. And I, I said, you just did that and like, you just came to town for an hour. They had nothing to do and you earned 10 bucks doing that. And she goes, yeah. And I'm like, that's awesome. That is so awesome. Just like, you know, hey, I ain't got nothing going on. Let's go make some money. Yeah. That's the way you do it. Like, I ain't got nothing going on. Let's go make some money. Mm. You, know? <laughs> you used to uh, on one salary, then two, then. Are you talking about like living wages? No, that's like, okay, that's part of the Cantillon effect. It ain't going to happen, right? As that new money is coming into the system, there's less available. I mean, the money doesn't purchase what it once did. So everybody at the end of the line has to come up with ever increasing amounts of money in order to have that standard of living. That's why we all have to have, that's why our wives have to work, why we have to have extra jobs, why, you know, all this, 
why the condition of the environment in it is is the way it is and it's only going to get worse this is why i'm trying to tell people it's like you got to get on the right side of the wedge on this thing because this is not going to get easier the standard of living and the cost of living is is going to be the separation right the standard of living of the rich is going to go up the cost of living for the poor is going to continue to go up and it's going to get more difficult and that wedge that separation between the rich and the poor is going to grow even more it's there's no reversing this like i don't people say we need to do something about that and i'm like thinking that's a fairy tale that's being sold to somebody it ain't gonna happen you know it's up to you not a government not a not somebody you're gonna vote for or anything else it's up for you to figure out how you're gonna get on that side of the wedge screw everybody else right i mean i hate to i mean i don't like saying it like that but that's what you have to do you have to be the lion that goes and gets it like i mean would you let some other lion take take it from you no man no matter how much it is you're gonna take as much as you can in fact i love this video that i saw of this uh it was great i think i told you guys about it a while back but it was like i don't know some like zoo or something like that anyway the video it starts off it's this pile of chicken and right? it's all these chicken parts like you know chicken legs wings whatever and it's this big pile of chicken and you see these three lions come around the corner of like this building. There's one of them that's ahead of all the rest. And he's a big, huge lion, big old mane. And he sees this pile of chicken and he jumps on the pile of chicken, like lays on this entire thing. And he has like his arms wrapped around this pile of chicken. And he's just like, his eyes are huge. And he's trying to growl at the other lions, but there's nothing he can do. He can't hold on to this chicken because it's a bunch of pieces. And you could it's almost as if you could feel the humor coming off of like the other lions like laughing at this guy as he's trying to protect all this chicken and they're just taking as much as they want from him but the point being is is that he wanted it all right he wanted all of it and even though it was more than he could ever possibly handle it was all going to be his and that's the type of attitude that you have to have when it comes to making money is that it's all got to be yours there's so much money out there flying around for everybody to take just go get it just go get as much as you can of it. If you figured it out, take as much as you can. Because it's not like you need to share it with anybody. They just keep printing it up. There is no, there is no, you've got, you've got enough. There isn't, right? It's all about how much more you can get. And then go do good with it. Like if you can acquire a lot of it, then go, go do good, you know? Get the money. There's no Marvel superheroes coming to save anyone. No, there isn't. And that's why I just get so, like, if we had the right person for president, no, that's bull. That is so bull. Like, there is nobody who's coming to save the day. There is nobody you can vote for. There is no, like, there's nobody. It's just you. You are it. You are the only one, you know? Uh, um... They keep in you with the Joneses, hyper-materialistic syndrome, yeah. People talk themselves into what they need, yeah. This is the start sounding Tia Lopez motivational speech or Tony Robbins. <laughs> um, well, you know, okay. You know, that's kind of funny when you listen to the, like some of those motivational speakers and stuff like that. To be honest with you, I would listen to him and it sounded like a bunch of, like, just, I don't even know how to describe it. It's like, I don't know, just made up stuff. Like, I don't even know. Like, it it, it didn't seem, you know, you hear these people, oh, you know, you think positive and all these positive things will happen to you and stuff like that. Okay. Um, yeah. No, no, right? What ends up happening is, is that you... Life changes when you make sure that it happens, when you change it, when you, when you, when you make a decision that you're no longer going to conduct yourself in a way that you once did, right? That's when things start to change and you don't even know what, what's going to happen. Like when I committed to making YouTube videos and I was putting out a YouTube video every day, I had no idea that it was going to blow up. I didn't know it was going to go to 106,000 subscribers. I didn't know I was going to be invited to go speak at the rebel capitalist someday. I didn't have any idea that Peter Schiff would someday be willing to come on my show when I started this YouTube channel. I had no idea of any of that stuff, right? But I had an idea that I wanted to have a YouTube channel where I could talk economics and it would be cool if I got paid. Didn't really care how much I got paid. Didn't even think about how much I was going to get paid because my entire goal was $100. 
because that was the threshold that you needed to order to get paid from Google. So that was my goal, $100, and to have a YouTube channel that I could talk economics with uh, with people. And when I committed to a video a day, the rest of the universe just started taking care of it. It was just like, hey, man, you got information you want to put out there? Boom, here you go, man. Here's a whole audience for you. What do you think of that? And I went, whoa, what the hell's going on here? Right? And so I just stepped to... Yeah, you know, I was like, okay, well, let's let's do this. What else can we do? You know, and next thing you know, you got a lot of options in front of you. Now, I could have like after the twentieth video that nobody was watching, given up on YouTube, but I didn't. Like, I caught one or two viewers, you know, and every once in a while somebody would comment, and then after a while, like you know, twelve of us were hanging out here on the channel. And I thought that's cool. I got twelve people who watch me. That's nice. And then it was 20, and then next thing you know, it was 100. It just kept growing. So this can happen with just about anything out there. So long as you have that, like, true intent to it, right? That passion for it. The, not like, I mean, if I had started this, it was like, man, I need to make a bunch of money. I'm going to start a YouTube channel so I can make a bunch of money. It never would have happened. I never would have been able to make a successful YouTube channel if I had, my whole intention was to try and make money with it. It just wouldn't have worked. My whole intention was to make videos that people would watch, that I could talk, you know, economics with, and the rest of it all fell into place. So, no, Tony, the the idea that you change, you are the change you want to be, you got to do it. You just have to, like, literally quit drinking one day and then go and start making videos. <laughs> I mean, that's what I did, right? <laughs> Uh, by paying me at this tier level, you'll get my course for human excellence. You'll be able to change your life to what you always dreamed. Uh, five payments of 450, you'll get a full month of content. Wow, man, pushing your system here. All right, well, I don't know. It's up to you guys. I think most of the information that you can get that will motivate you, you can get for free. All right. Now, there is places who will concentrate that information for you so you don't have to work so hard to get it. And it'll probably be pretty beneficial, you know, especially if you don't have the time for it. But all this stuff is for free out there. Okay? Everything. It was a joke? No, oh, that's a bummer, man. You should go and set it up. <laughs> Simon, we wish you a lot of success and prosperity. May the good Lord bless bless continue to bless you and your family well thank you very much i do appreciate that you know that that kind of statement um you know like i appreciate you guys being here i mean we got 319 of you out here i've been out for almost an hour and a half you're hanging out with me we're having these great conversations and i can't thank you enough for it um you know like it seems like every one of these live streams, I end up kind of going into this thing, you know, where I where I end up thanking you guys for like, you know, this life changing thing that you've done for me. But it's, you know, it's true. It's like, I don't know what I'd be doing without you. You know, it'd be a very much different world for me. And, um, you know, I just can't thank you enough for it. So. All right. Let's see. Simon, if you want more subscribers, I know tons of simple ways to get them. Too long to type in here. Um, well, I, I don't I, I do want more subscribers. Don't get me wrong. But if you notice that I have never once ever asked for anybody to subscribe to my channel, not one time. All right. Have I ever done it? There was a time like right around July where I was just shy of the hundred thousand that I said I think it would be cool if I could get enough subscribers to hit the 100,000 mark over the 4th of July weekend. And I got like 5,000 subscribers like <laughs> in like two weeks or something. It was incredible. Like I got a lot of subscriptions from that, from a lot of people who were trying to get me up over that 100,000 mark, you know, for the 4th of July weekend. But that was the only time I've ever asked for subscriptions. And I don't want people to subscribe to the channel if they're not truly like enjoying this channel. I want people who want to be here. I don't want to be like, I don't want a million subscribers and only have 10,000 of them who really appreciate the channel. I want a million subscribers who really appreciate the channel. And that's what I'm going for. So I don't ask for subscriptions because I feel that if you truly enjoy the channel, you would just go ahead and subscribe and you wouldn't need my, my, you know, my asking of you. 
And same thing with the videos. Like I never ask you guys to like the videos. I do ask you to like the live streams just so the YouTube algorithm will pick it up and get more people to come into the into the live stream. But outside of the live streams, I never ask for you guys to like the videos. And if you do like them, I feel that you will probably hit the like button on it. And then I will know if I have put out a good video. If I ask you to like the video and you don't really like the video, then how do I know if I'm doing a good job or not? You know, same thing. Like it kind of bummed me out when YouTube took away the thumbs down because I, I wanted you guys to hit the thumbs down if you didn't like it. For one, it lets me know what I'm doing, you know, if I'm doing it right. And then the other thing is YouTube doesn't really care if it's a thumbs out or thumbs down. They just looking for engagements. And so if you're hitting that thumbs down when you don't like the video, that's almost as good as if it's hitting a thumbs up too, right? So it's again, it's all about the YouTube algorithm and how many engagements are happening there. So that's really, you know, that's what I got going on. I don't really want more subscribers. I want quality subscribers. That's it. And if it's, you know, if I have to wait for them, then that's what I'll do. I'll wait, you know. You rock it. It's mutual appreciation. Well, thank you, Scott. You know, I mean, you know, I could come out here and I could try and do some doomsday scenario stuff. And I could try and scare the hell out of everybody with some of the things that I think about. Because believe me, when you're, when you study macroeconomics at the level that, you know, a lot of us do. You can see some some pretty bad times for some people coming up. And, you know, when you think about famines and hunger and wars and stuff like that, it, it doesn't leave you in a very, like, positive state, right? It leaves you actually in a very, like, stressed and, you know, worrisome place. Studying the economy is not fun. It's actually pretty depressive. I mean, they don't call it the dismal science for nothing. And so when I think about like some of the things that, you know, people are looking to try and find the information on, it's easy to be in a, in a position in which that you are looking for the information that this ends up scaring the hell out of you. For one, I don't understand it and I do it too, but people like having the hell scared out of them. Like if, like they enjoy it or something. I don't know. I don't know why it is, but I mean, I do it too. Like I read stuff. It's like, oh my gosh, this is really coming down or whatever. And for some reason, I enjoy reading that. You know, um, but that's not that's not what I'm gonna do here. Like what I want to do is I really want to try and to explain the economy in a way that people can look at it and say, hey man, I'm gonna make this decision for myself because I truly do understand this economy. Like I am becoming economically aware. And, you know, a lot of times when you're listening to somebody talk about the economy, they're coming at it from a point of an investment that they have made, right? They're banking on the stock market going up or they're banking on, you know, whatever, their particular business to do better. And so when they're, when they're doing that, they're looking for information that is going to confirm their bias, right? That it's going to confirm that for them. And you'll find it. You can find all the information that you want that will confirm your bias. And so... You know, you have to be a lot of, you have to take on a lot of concern when you're following these people and that you're not just falling into what their opinions of beliefs and stuff are, but the actual facts that they're trying to present. They have nuggets of information that are gold, but a lot of times it's wrapped up in a paranoia that, you know, it just makes it very difficult to try and absorb, you know. All right. Uh, they like being scared for a reason because they like to be told what to do. Um, no, you're right about that. Actually, um, you're very well right. People want to be told, hey, if you do this, you're going to be OK. Right? So or if you, know, you better protect yourself from this or else you won't be OK. You know, that's what they, they want to hear that to think that they have made a decision in which that is nobody else knows about or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's, again, like I, I, you know, I see people get paranoid, especially like during right when the pandemic started kicking in. And I mean, you think about it, I study a lot of economics. And so when I start babbling on about economics, like I really can easily go right over somebody's head and just like, you know, be talking way above them and they're not getting anything that I'm talking about. Now, when I listen to somebody else talk to me about economics, I realize that they're just spitting out shit that they've heard on the news and they don't really know anything about economics except for some political point of view that has them believing that they understand economics. But they really don't because when I hear them talk, they don't know anything about Fed funds rates. They don't know anything about how the repo market works. They don't know anything about like mortgage backed securities or the Fed balance sheet. And so when I think about that, it's like you don't really understand the economy. You understand a political view 
Like I get that part of it, which is, you know, you might be even pretty accurate about that. But as far as actually understanding what's happening with the economy and making appropriate decisions for yourself, I, I see a lot of people who talk that really just don't understand what they're talking about. And so again, during the pandemic, when I'm listening to people give me stats about like how many sick people there are and how quickly everybody dies and blah, 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 blah. And I'm listening to him going, you got this all off of the news and you really don't know anything. And they're like, oh no, I went to the place myself and I got the information. I got my own stats and all this other stuff. And I'm like, okay, well, it sounds exactly like the stuff that I'm hearing on the news. All right. So I want to know like really how many people are more concerned about dying from COVID as opposed to dying in a car accident. All right. And nobody that I talked to cared about dying in a car accident. Like nobody cared that they were going to be potentially killed in a car. Zero concern. Now, in the county that I live in, I knew a couple of the people who passed away during the COVID epidemic and they died with COVID. Now, whether it was actually from COVID or not, it's, you know, it was blamed on COVID. But more people died in the county of car accidents than COVID, but nobody was concerned about dying in a car. Right. So when everybody was giving me the stats about being concerned about it, I'm thinking, why aren't you giving me stats about car accidents right now? Right. I mean, you want to be statistical about it and you want to talk about deaths, but you don't want to tell me about how many car deaths are in the county. And you don't even know. But you know how many people died of COVID and how many people are going to die of COVID. Right. So that stuff doesn't make sense to me. I don't follow into that stuff. Yeah. All right. Hello, Simon. Hey, the doc. Hello. Uh, my mother killed herself, sorry about that, because of the lockdowns. I will never forgive anyone involved in the pandemic parade charades. Parade charades, yeah. Um, that's, that's, that's quite unfortunate. Now, I mean, I don't want to give excuses or anything else like that, but if government entity comes down on you to the point that you commit suicide over it, then you've given too much faith to the government. Okay. You've put in too much trust or too much belief or something into them. And that should never have taken place. People should not be trusting this government. Nobody should trust their government. In fact, the forefathers wanted us to be so fearful of our government that the government would be like, at the verge of collapse every minute of the day because that's how pissed the people were about it, right? That's the type of environment that we really need to be in is that this government should be so fearful of us that they just don't conduct themselves. They don't behave in bad behaviors, right? Because they know that we would just totally destroy them. But nobody does that. Nobody, they're not in fear of that. And nobody is even remotely concerned about taking over the government. They don't, you know. And the few that did just got we're basically set up so i don't mean to laugh at that but they were you know uh don't trust Ver um verify applies to a way more than btc damn straight yeah getting there yeah verify than trust amen simon i'm accountable to for me and that's that's it you know i mean you know, that's why it just drives me nuts when I hear somebody say, well, I'm, you know, we can blame this all on the administration. And it was just like, you can blame it all on the administration because you can try to find up, find some excuse for why your life sucks, right? I mean, I don't blame anything on the administration. I don't blame anything on anybody out there. It's the environment that we are in. Go deal with it. Yeah. It was like... <laughs> You know, it's like somebody arguing, like, I think I use the analogy of like bailing out a boat. You don't like when your boat is sinking, you don't like look over at the person who caused the problem and say, hey, man, this is your fault that we're all going to die. Right. It, you don't do that. You just go and save everybody. You start bailing out the boat and you figure out how it is that everybody's going to survive. And then after everybody done, then you can go and chew out that guy. You can go and give him a hard time or whatever. But at the time that you're dying or sinking. Is not a time that you start blaming other people for your problems, right? You start dealing with it, no matter how you got there. <laughs> My girlfriend put her daughter back 
a year in school because she doesn't think that the online learning in 2020 was proper for a year learning and socializing. We should have done some same for all kids. Um, I'm going to disagree. My now my youngest boy, he probably didn't do as well at home you know, doing the remote learning as he does in school because he's a very social kid who likes to be at school. The older one, who is also a social kid, but he does much better on the online train. Like, the the remote learning, he excelled at. He did so much better that way than any other form of learning. And I was just like, man, they should just offer that to him all the time. Like, you know, just... Go have him go to school and then he can take the, the remote learning. But no, they, they do it the regular way. And he does okay in school, but he just excelled at that. And so, like, some kids probably didn't do very well. Other ones probably did quite well. I mean, I was amazed. Like, he would, like, I would watch him. He would be doing his homework. And then all of a sudden, I'd see him. He'd go over to the computer. He'd type. He'd wait. And all of a sudden, bink, I would hear his teacher come on. And he would be like, I have problems. I have this math problem or whatever I'm trying to work on. She would work on it with him and then the computer would kick off and he'd go back to doing his work again and i thought man this is just brilliant i mean he was doing all his work he's getting it done he's on time everything was working really well anyway uh schools propagate learning more than sharing info yeah i mean to be honest schools are all about regurgitating information right here Here's a bunch of information. Now be able to regurgitate it to me, right? Can you sit, spit it all out again? Okay, perfect. You're learned, right? I mean, is that any way to teach somebody how to have any kind of critical thought? Yeah. <laughs> all right. Uh, I'm out. No lumber update. Bye. Oh, you want lumber update? Are you still with us? I mean, I did a lumber update earlier. Yeah. <laughs> the AI is going to lay off a lot of these lazy office workers. Yeah. Uh, I wish I would have just went and gotten my GED halfway through high school. Could have saved a lot of time. Yeah, I mean, I got my diploma, but I don't think everybody's... I don't think anybody's ever seen it. Like, I don't think I've ever shown anybody my diploma other than maybe my family the day I got it. But nobody's ever asked for it. I don't even know where it is. So I don't know what the, I don't even know what the use of a high school diploma is. Like, I mean, I can understand maybe for the individual to say, Hey man, I got through it. I went through all the school and stuff. And maybe if you're going to go to college or something, you need the high school diploma, but like employee employees don't, you know, employers don't look for it from their employees. I've never been asked and nobody I know has ever been asked for it. You can just pretty much make up your grades, you know, you know, like, oh, I'm a 4.0 student or whatever. I mean, nobody ever jacks, you know, especially if you got like just a regular working class job and they don't give a shit if you had an, if you, if you graduated high school, you know. <laughs> so many, I follow non-college diploma. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 I just never was even like interested in going to school like i mean sitting and going to school was more about just hanging out like with friends and stuff i didn't go to school so i could learn and i certainly wasn't going to go pay for college or something like that so i just wasn't into it uh, an educated economist you should look at petrobras stock symbol pbr pbr dividend is hard to believe yeah um i might do that I've been thinking about, like, I really am not really interested in getting into the stock market. I mean, there could be a good, you know, some pretty good stocks out there that you could buy that'll do quite well. But I'm not really into, like, getting into the stock market until I see the spread on the five-year, 30-year start to widen. Now, again, like, I'm not a, an investor, and it's not like I know anything about investments or how to make money doing investments. But when I hear Alan Greenspan, and they asked him about the recession and the two-year tenure being an indicator with the inversion of the two-year tenure treasury that being an indicator of a recession he says yeah that's very good he says but what he likes to look at is the spread between the five-year and 30-year and when you see that spread between the five-year and 30-year grow that is corporate management's willingness to invest 
Now, whatever the hell that means, I don't know. But if the corporate management is willing to invest, then I guess that I probably will be too. And if you look at the spread between the 30-year 30 30 and the 5-year right now, you can see that the thing is like actually negative and gone flat quite a bit. And there is no widening spread happening right now. So I'm not interested in investing into the stock market until I see that spread start to happen again. Um, and at that point, then, yeah, I might start getting into some of these other stocks and stuff. Until then, I'm really kind of just sticking with Altria, Marlboro Cigarettes, and Anheuser-Busch. I'm not really, I don't drink or smoke or anything, but I do know a little bit about addiction, and so that's the one that I just happen to be on. I don't buy very much of it, but it is one stock that I do buy. So, anyway. Uh, Simon, get one. Psychologically, still don't know what's wrong with me. Um, what were we talking about? Simon got one psychologically. Still don't know what's wrong with me. Okay. Uh, Simon, let's see here. Uh, ratio is under three. Wow. The PE ratio is under three. That's pretty good. Don't you want like, what is it they say? You want it like 10 or less on the PE ratio? Uh, diplomas have become fiat. <laughs> All right. I've never been asked to see my diplomas. Yeah. Uh, the Industrial Revolution brought the Persian factory worker ringing school systems of education. Education is a tool. You don't expect your tools to do the job, do you? You do the job. I guess you just don't know how to use the tools called education. No, you're right. I don't. Like, I absolutely do not know how to use the tools of education. When I went to school, they said that I have learning disabilities. I can't read. I can't keep up with the rest of the students out there. And that I'm pretty much a dumb shit. Now, they didn't say that directly to me. But, you know, when you're a little kid and you can't figure out what it is that's going on and they put you in these remedial classes with a bunch of other dumb little kids, then, yeah, you know, you kind of grow up feeling like you're not going to really be adequate to, to take on school, right? But then you realize that you're damn good at problem solving, right? Like, really good at it. In fact, I went and my parents, when I was like three, let's see, third grade or so, um, I was like around eight. I went up to uh, Oregon State University and they ran a bunch of tests to try and figure out what was going on and how come I wasn't keeping up with the rest of the kids. And they came to the conclusion that I had a reading disability, right? Reading retention. Right. So I'd read for a few minutes and then like after that, I just wasn't taking in the information. I could sit there and read the entire page, but not re recall anything that I read. And then they gave me like all these little puzzles to solve and all these little things to figure out and stuff. And they found out that I could do problem solving on a genius level, but had a hard time retaining information. Right, This reading information problem. Did anybody do anything to try and help me like excel at that? Like, here's your, you know, you're good at problem solving. Do you think they ever, like, did anything to try and, like, you know, enhance that or anything? No. Like, I just went right back into this, have a reading disability. And so, and so here I am in school trying to conduct myself with the rest of the kids, knowing that I have this reading disability and no real, like, help to try and, like, push the things that I was good at. Right? So I had to find those things on my own. Like I found that I was good at shop class. So I just hung out up there at the shop classes all the time. And I guess by doing that, then I got good at doing construction work and then fell and found myself like, you know, building homes and eventually getting into that kind of line of business. As far as sales go, like I had to learn that all on my own. There wasn't anybody who taught me anything about sales. So yeah, it was a difficult road for me. Education? No, not for me. It wasn't going to happen. And when somebody is just like, you know, you just don't know how to use the tools of it. You're right. I don't. I don't know how to use the tools of education. I got, I got a stack of economics books higher than, taller than I am. And I have a hell of a time cracking, cracking them open and reading through them. Like I have a difficult time with that stuff. So all the things that I've learned, you got to understand that I have learned this by piecing it together from everywhere like when i would read if like i would print out a federal reserve speech and it would take me five days to read through it like 
I would find some little line in there that I just didn't understand. And I would research whatever it was that they were talking about until I finally figured it out. And sometimes I would have to go through two or three of these speeches in order to just understand what one of them was. And I mean, this is the type of effort that I had to go through where most people would just read the speech and retain it. I would have to read it over and over and over again, you know, and this is the type of effort that I had to put into it. But now I can regurgitate a lot of this stuff, right? So I kind of taught myself how to do it. When I was in school, if they were like, here, you're going to have to learn this Federal Reserve speech and all the Fed funds rate and all that other stuff, it wouldn't have happened. It just would not have happened. Not for me anyway. For other people, it might have. So... You know, we all have to learn a little differently, and that's the way I go go about it. It's just like I had to do what I had to do. I mean, you know, I wish that YouTube existed when I was in high school. Because then, whatever it was that they were talking about, I could have gone and watched videos and listened to other people's opinions and got my information the way I would need it, the way I learned. And then I could go back and, you know, actually have a discussion with my class about it or something like that. But when they were like, here, you need to read, you know, 100 pages this week. I didn't do it. I mean, I didn't do it. So. <laughs> All right. Uh, I really try not to distract, but sometimes my inner smart ass comes out of my phones. <laughs> uh, the biggest stoner I knew in my high school, I understand. I understand how now is a nuclear engineer at a power plant and is doing absolutely fantastic and has a wonderful family. Um I don't I don't see where marijuana ha I mean, I guess like if you're using it during a time when you when you should be paying attention, that's probably it, but the actual consumption of marijuana I don't really find does anything to to people like you know people are like oh short-term memory loss and all that you know, stuff i don't see that i mean i think it's a bunch of hoopla that people have made up to try and make fun of stoners and call them deadbeats and losers and stuff like that but for the most part i cannot find where a hard-working individual is pushed down by the consumption of marijuana i don't i don't see it like you know they don't wake up hung over you know, go, tr you know, trash in their, you know, cars or something in the middle of the night drunk or something like this is not not the behavior of the typical stoner out there. Now, granted, when I was in high school, like a lot of my stoner buddies were not very motivated in general. So whether it was weed or not, I don't think they would have done anything with their life to begin with. So um, I don't think marijuana helped with that. But if you are a motivated person who is, you know, making it happen i don't know where marijuana actually inhibits that like i don't i don't see that you know um if you were doing it all the time maybe like you know throughout the entire day or something then i could see it but as far as casual use i don't see it it's not nearly as harmful as as some of the other stuff that's out there and i don't mean to be like you know the type of person who says marijuana is okay because I, I don't think it's like, okay. I don't think any drugs are okay. I mean, most people who are clouding their minds with it are probably doing it for some other reason, you know? Um, but as far as like the experience that I've had watching, you know, watching families get destroyed with alcohol, I don't see really families being destroyed with marijuana. Not, not in the sense of just the consumption. There was a time like, you know, with, if somebody was growing or dealing or something like that, then the illegal behaviors of it would be harmful to the family. But the actual, like, you know, being drunk around your family or being stoned around your family, like, being drunk around your family is a horrible thing. Being stoned, I don't really see it that bad. Like, I see stoners walking around and they're in a great mood. They're usually pretty positive, you know, kind of goofy, but not belligerent not mean not destructive not that kind of behavior you know? uh -huh. let's see marijuana is not addicting it's fine i do it for higher cognitive abilities uh, bad in high school i am actually very allergic to it myself yeah Marijuana. 
Dishes every day in the house, yeah. Smoked since 75, not broke, in fact, set, yeah. And that's, and that's the thing, like, I mean, I don't, like, I've seen a lot of destruction of, of people and their lives and stuff like that, but for the most part, like, you know, smoking weed, it's like, it's like smoking cigarettes. Have you ever seen anybody destroy their lives smoking cigarettes? You know, I mean, this doesn't make sense. The only reason why marijuana destroyed anybody's lives in the past is because it was illegal. They got arrested or, you know, something like that happened and then that destroyed their lives. It, it is addictive. I'm a daily user, but alcohol wasn't great for me, so I picked my poison. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I'm not going to say that it's not addictive because I would think that anything is addictive. Like even... You know, coffee's addictive, right? I mean, everything's addictive. There's nothing... Running can be addictive. You know, somebody who gets addicted to jogging or something like that. I mean, so... Uh, I get high just driving in, stop and go traffic on the highway. The amount of reefer pouring from people's <laughs> cars these days is insane. <laughs> All right. Uh, people have said that they take magic mushrooms immediately cure them from chronic depression. You know, I've heard other people say that too. And I've, like, I've done magic mushrooms. I come from an area that they really are, per <laughs> they grow everywhere. Right? But, um, I didn't microdose. I was, I mean, I didn't microdose anything like that. Uh, and, and to be honest with you, the few times that I did actually do mushrooms, um, I felt depressed the next day from it. I felt down. I didn't feel like it cured my depression at all. Um, but then again, I wasn't micro dosing. I was like, you know, I was really dosing. You know? Uh, it's mentally addictive. I smoke. Wish I never started only because of the financial cost. If it could have been grown if it could have been grown and stored like wheat or any other grain. Um, it will, I mean, then quit, man. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's like if you, if you wish you hadn't started, then you should just quit. It's ridiculous. I smell pot coming from vehicles every day driving. I don't know about mushrooms, but ketamine, ketamine has been everything but cleared by the FDA for the treatment of severe depression. You know, I think depression could be cured with meditation, exercise, healthy diet. Um, I'm not... I'm not one to like, you know, try and diagnose or treat or deal with any kind of depression. I'm just talking about for my own self and the things that I've experienced that most of, most of the things that were causing me to feel bad, I could cure with just proper thoughts and good environment and, you know, being conscious in my living and, you know, not allowing, like, cause a lot of people just want to allow themselves to be in that state. I wanted, like, there's times that I wanted to as well, but then, you know, you force yourself not to do that. Um, you know, again, I can't, I, I mean, I can't really talk about that thing. I just, what I've experienced myself. Uh, Simon, what is your number one conspiracy theory that you believe? Um, I don't think it's a conspiracy theory, but the number one thing is that, um, is that we're all sovereign citizens and that um, we are actually separated from the state. If you think about the corporate person, you know, signing your name in all capital letters, your social security number, that sort of thing. That, if you're, if you're familiar with your straw man or the straw man, you know, kind of thing or, you know, the sovereign person or something like that, governments hate it when you talk about this stuff because it's, there's a lot of truth. There's, there's a lot of hoopla to it too, but there's a lot of truth that's inside of it in that, you are not the person that you think you are when you sign your name to the dotted line. When you look at a check, here's an easy way to find it. Go and grab your checkbook right now, right? You got a checkbook, right? Take a minute, go find your checkbook and go grab that thing, okay? Because I'm going to show you on that checkbook where it is that this exists, this corporate person, this straw man, right? And so if you don't believe that you have an identity that is separated from you, the real person, 
right? Then go and look at that checkbook, okay? If you got it right now, go and look at the line that you sign your name to, right? Now, if you look really closely, all the lines on your check, on that checkbook, or on the check that you write, all the lines are solid, except the one that you sign your name to. And if you look really closely, it looks like a series of dots, right? It's not a solid line. Now, go and take a magnifying glass and look at that line. And look at what the micro print says on that line. It says, authorized signature. Why would they do that? Why would they make that line so small in print that you can't even read it and then make it look like a line? Right? There is very... The, when you want to talk about conspiracy theories, ask the question, why? Why did they do that? Why does it say authorized signature there instead of just being a solid line? It only makes sense that that's where you would put your name. It's because you are the authorized person to sign for that particular account, that straw man account. It's written in capital letters, your first name and your last name. Anything that you get that is attached to that corporate person will have your name spelled entirely in capital letters. This is very important to realize because I didn't really believe it either until one day that I got my buddy who was really big into all this stuff and I just didn't believe anything he said actually showed me a letter from the IRS that he got because he was, you know, straight up sovereign person, didn't allow anybody to use his name or whatever and had a copyright and all that other crap that you hear about. He had the IRS send him a letter where his name was spelled in lowercase letters. It's the only time I've ever seen it. Right? And it was not an accident. It was done on purpose. So that's the biggest conspiracy theory that I think a lot of people should go and try and realize out there that their birth certificate that they have done has actually signed them up for a bond that is a million dollar bond in their name. And they have access to that million dollars. This is really strange to, to try and wrap your head around, but it's called accepted for value. Now, I, I know that a lot of people are just going to be totally lost on this, but if you can imagine that anything that was a debt that has your name attached to it immediately turning into a check, into a payment to you, that's the conspiracy theory that I am talking about. If you want one that is the biggest conspiracy theory, it's that. That's the one. So figure that one out, and if you are really good at it, I wouldn't say a whole lot of pe tell a whole lot of people about it because the government's going to be quite un unhappy with you if you spread that information around. So that's as far as I'm going to take that for you. If you want to go figure it out, go figure it out on your own. Uh, um, <laughs> yeah, there we go. All nighter knows about this stuff, right? All nighter, he knows. <laughs> Uh, what's crazy is the owl picture so small that you can't see it with your bare eyes on the corner of the $1 bill. Yeah, um, here, let me show you where that's at. Let me get the $1 bill. So a lot of people don't realize that the owl is actually a symbolism for the Illuminati. So they'll put an owl in a lot of uh, a lot of little secretive spots, places that you wouldn't normally see it. So um, it's here on the dollar, and it's up in the corner. And so, boy, I can hardly see it myself. But if you look on a dollar bill, right? And now what you want to look is right here at the very corner, right in there, right up here in the corner, there is, in the design of like, there's this frame that goes around the dollar, like this little tiny, like, just looks like a little frame. In the very corner of it, I'm going to put this like right there there's a little tiny owl you can hardly even see it it looks like a little speck right there but that's where the owl is on the uh on the dollar bill and again a lot of people point at that saying that's the uh the illuminati symbol there you know showing their dominance over you bohemian grove symbol yeah all right is it a pygmy owl it is on that dollar it's tiny you can hardly see it um what is he talking about with this conspiracy theory? I am completely lost. Where can I get more info on it? Um, I don't know. I mean, there's, I, I don't know. Hey, all nighter. Where's there a good, where's there a good spot that somebody could get some like, in, some initial information into something like that? Um, there's a few websites out there that talk about it, but as far as like a, 
Man, I don't know. Because, like, I, I pieced this information again myself from all, all over the place. Um, I don't know where where to go to, to try and find that. Here we go. All nighter. Uh, all right. TJ Mars only shares credible information on urlaw.org. All right. So go check that one out, urlaw.org. And um, maybe start there. Uh, ask some of the questions. Like, you know, maybe just Google name all in capital letters and just start researching some of the information off of it. You are going to be blown away. This is probably one of the most non... I don't even know how to say it. Um, unaware. Like, people are so unaware of this particular concept. It is so far off for them. And it is such a, like difficult thing to wrap your head around that most people just blow it off for like you know complete conspiracy like it doesn't exist it's completely fabricated but it's it's the real deal like i mean it's 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 weird to think but yeah you are separated from the corporate person like your driver's license the okay here's here's something for you this is this is this is kind of like another little example here let me see if i can kind of help you out with it when you buy a car, right, you go and you buy a car and you get the title for the car, like you pay cash for it, right? So you get the certificate of title and says, hey, man, I own this car. This is my car. But you have to register it with the state, right? And then the state makes you pay a fee for registering it with them. And you have to buy insurance if you're going to drive it on the road. Now, if this piece of property was mine, how come I have to do all this stuff, right? And people are like, well, that's just the law. No, wait a minute. If I own this piece of property, it's as if it belongs to me. It's my skin, right? It's my property. It's as if it, you know, it, like I said, it's as if it was my skin. And that includes this car or anything else that's in it. It's all my property, my private property. Now, the funny thing is, is that when you get a title for your car, you're getting a certificate of title. It's not the title. It's a certificate of title. See, the car actually comes with a... What is it? A uh, manufactured statement of origin, right? So the manufactured statement of origin, that is like the birth certificate for the car, right? And then that manufactured statement of origin goes to the state, gets a picture taken of it, put on microfilm, and then a certificate of title is issued out in its place. So now the certificate of title has the state somewhat, has some interest with the state. They own a little tiny piece of it, so, so to speak, because you don't actually own the manufacturer's statement of origin. What you own is a certificate of title that says that the manufacturer's statement of origin does exist back at the state who actually owns it, who has it, right? So with the certificate of title, now you have possession of the vehicle that you can then trade or sell or do whatever you want with it. But in order to conduct yourself with that piece of property that isn't truly yours because you don't have the manufacturer's statement of origin, you have a certificate that says you have possession of it. Now you have to be subject to the state's laws of insurance and all the other stuff that goes with it and behaving in a fashion that is appropriate to the, to the road and to your driver's license because you also agreed with your straw man that you are going to behave in such fashions by getting that driver's license. Okay, so this is something that everybody kind of can get their heads wrapped around. Imagine this. You're driving down the road with your car and you have the manufactured statement of origin. Right, not the not the certificate of title, but the actual manufacturer's statement of origin that says this car belongs to me, nobody else. It is completely one hundred percent mine, not the state's. Like no involvement with them. I own it. You get pulled over, and the cop says, "Hey, man, you don't have a license. You don't have insurance. You don't have anything that gives you any kind of legal authority to drive this vehicle on the road. The car's coming with me." And you can say, "No, sir. Okay, I have the manufacturer's statement of origin." This car uh, belongs to me as if it was my own skin. And unless you are a judge and jury and the executioner of uh, laws, you can't arbitrarily just take my private property from me because this doesn't have anything to do with being involved with the state. Now, that right there is really difficult for people to wrap their heads around, but that's the truth of the matter. You are separate. From everything else out there, you are the king of your own self, your own property, your own mind, everything that goes with it. And wherever you stand is your kingdom at the time that it is. And all your possessions belong to you personally. 
Now, if you go and register your car with the state, well, you give up some of that, right? If you go and get a driver's license, right, then you give up some of that. You go and sign up for a job and agree that they're going to tax you. You give up your sovereign citizenship, right? You are accepting the corporate identity. And that's where most people end up living is in that corporate identity their entire life. Never realizing that they have true freedom just right there as if it was a coat that they could take off. They don't even know it. Okay? And so once you kind of become aware of the sovereign citizen and the corporate identity and stuff, all of a sudden you realize like you have two lives. You got you, the person, the actual living person, the living, breathing, walking individual. And then you got this corporate identity that conducts business throughout the rest of the, you know, the rest of the world. And stuff. So once you have the, the, the knowledge of these two identities, it really changes a lot. It, it changes a lot of the way you behave and the way you feel about the government and just a lot. You know? That's a difficult one. Most people won't, won't ever research that one. You know? Uh, you can actually do the sovereign citizen thing, but you have to actually be an expert in several kinds of law, like admiralty and English common law. Yeah. And see, that's just the thing. Most people are not going to sit around because you're not going to get taught. Nobody's going to, I mean, I guess there is some people who will teach you how to do it, but for the most part, you're going to have to learn how to do all that on your own. Like figure out all that law, all the conditions, everything about it. I mean... You know, to be able to walk into a court and say, no, sir, I'm not going to plead guilty or not guilty. Right? I'm not going to do that. And if the court decides that they're going to enter a plea of not guilty and you say, I'm sorry, sir, but if you are entering a plea of not guilty on my behalf, then you are practicing law from the bench and that is illegal. You can't do that. Right. To be able to talk in fashions like that is the reason why people can get away with being a sovereign citizen. But if you allow that judge to just go ahead and enter a plea of not guilty because you chose not to put a plea in and you don't stand up for your rights and say, I'm sorry, sir, you cannot be practicing law from the bench like that, then they're just going to steamroll right over you and do whatever the hell they want to. You You have to understand that law better than they do or else they're going to get you. And most people can't can't put all that information into, you know, to take on that kind of information and have that much available to them i mean especially for the casual person who may accidentally get themselves into trouble to be able to you know to be able to be that sort of person where you can spit out that information and to know right away what it is that you need to say at the time that you need to say it i mean most people aren't going to be that way like for me i understand it but you know as far as like trying to conduct myself in a courtroom as a sovereign citizen there ain't no way i mean there's no way that i could do it i would be in jail before i knew it you know all right roads are not private property and it's a privilege to drive on the public road you can drive the vehicle on your own property and the lawns won't and the laws won't exist that's right and if you own the manufacturer statement of origin you can also use the right to travel in that they cannot stop you from doing that because you have a right to travel more than they have a law to prevent you from doing it right so once you understand the right to travel and you understand the rights of property and you understand the way that you can explain this you know to a, a law enforcement officer so they don't actually beat you up or take you away then you can probably live as a sovereign citizen most people can't do that right and most people end up you know either getting themselves into trouble or doing something else that that isn't going to be like what they were wanting, right? They they end up living in poverty or something like that because they can't get a job or can't pay taxes or can't get a loan or anything else like that. You know, there's there's a lot to think about when it comes to the sovereign citizen thing. Might still get tossed in jail, but the appeal is the remedy. Yeah. See, like you, you have to be willing, you have to be, you have to be willing to like, you know, not be scared about going to jail if you want to take on that kind of thing. Like, you know, because that's what it takes. You know, you, you have to be that confident inside of it that says, man, if I screw up, I'm going to go to jail. But that's OK. I am i don't mind. I'm going to do that. You know, and so I mean, most people aren't going to be willing to take on that. All right. Face tattoos always make traffic stops go smoothly. <laughs> I bet. All right. All right. 
Uh, the term girlfriend and boyfriend was only invented in the 1910s before it, before the only co-educational space between men and women were brothels. Uh, can sovereign citizens get a mortgage from a bank? Well, yeah, you can get any, you can do anything you want. You just have to be able to conduct yourself in a way that, you know, doesn't get you, get you into trouble. I mean, the sovereign citizen wouldn't like, if they took out a loan for a bank, they would turn that loan directly into a cash payment, right? So they would accept it for value and the loan would then basically be absolved and they would have the house for nothing. Right. I mean, that's the, the way this, the sovereign citizen would work with the accepted for value. I don't know how all that works. Like, I've watched a bunch of videos on it and seen other people who have attempted to do this and say they've actually done it. OK, like, I don't know anybody personally has actually done it. I've seen YouTube videos on it, but this accepted for value thing seems to be legit if you can figure it out where you can like if there is a debt with your name attached to it, you can turn that into a check. <laughs> Because they created an instrument of debt using your name, and your name is copyrighted, and they can't do that. That's illegal. If I got that right, like, you know, I mean, what do I know? I'm not a sovereign citizen. I just kind of read up on that stuff. You own a vehicle with the certificate of origin and keep it on your property. The roadway is not your property. It is shared, and we pay to drive on it. What you are saying is not accurate. Okay, I, whatever, man. I'm not trying to say, like... If you can find anybody out there who is truly living like a sovereign citizen, who is excelling at life, like, swimmingly, like all the rest of the people out there, then go ask that person for it, right? Somebody asked me what my opinion about the biggest conspiracy theory out there is. I've said it. I've tried to explain to it as, you know, as easily as I can understand it. I'm not trying to say, hey, man, you can go and get this manufacturer's statement of origin on a vehicle because I've never heard of anybody who ever had one. Like, nobody. Like, never seen it, never don't know anybody who has one. So whether or not they can conduct themselves on the road with it or not, I don't know. I don't know anybody who's ever done it, right? I'm just saying that the theory behind it says that this could happen. I, I, you know, go figure it out. I don't know. This sovereign citizen thing is super interesting. Need to study this. Yeah, it's a, it's quite a trip. I mean, I spent a good year, you know, like just researching different, different, you know, people talking about the whole sovereign citizen thing. And um, there is some people out there who are really good at it. I mean, they really know their stuff. Um, and it's very interesting just to kind of have the knowledge behind it. Because then you can really see it. It's just everywhere. Like you see it in your bank. You see it at the, you know, from the IRS. You see it everywhere you go. You see this corporate person and you realize that, man, you conduct yourself as a corporate person pretty much all the time. And very rarely, only when you are actually talking with a friend or somebody else, are you actually conducting yourself as the real person. Most of the time you're conducting yourself as the corporate identity. You know, anytime you do business, basically. Uh... What are Carter Carter bonds? Carter bonds are um, back when Jimmy Carter was president um, towards the end of the 70s, the late 70s, the United States was going through some serious issues with the dollar value. Like the dollar was losing like value like crazy. It was weakening like beyond belief. The inflation was running crazy. The rest of the world, it wasn't like the condition that we are sitting in today. Like the inflation that we were experiencing was pretty much here in the United States, where the United States itself hated the dollar and we were calling it, you know, garbage and it was going to go away and stuff. The rest of the world during that time, they wanted dollars, right? I mean, during this whole inflationary scenario, it was pretty much in the United States that was experiencing it. While the rest of the world was going, oh man, we need dollars to pay off our debts. And so the dollar strengthened on the world scale. At the same time, the United States was seeing this inflation. During the Carter administration, that wasn't happening. The inflation was running rampant here in the United States, and the rest of the world was saying, piss on you. We don't want your dollar. You got off the gold standard. You, you know, you're a worthless currency, and you done tricked us. So we're out of here, right? And the Carter administration was having a hell of a time. The, the Treasury at the time 
trying to to issue out debt, trying to sell these treasuries out there because nobody really wanted them and the interest rates were going up that much higher, again, because of all the fear for the dollar at the time. So what they did was, is they're like, okay, we won't issue out in dollars. We'll issue out these treasuries in Swiss francs and German marks. How about that? All right, so if you don't want to borrow in dollars, we'll borrow in francs and German German marks and we'll pay you back in that. And so during the Carter administration, those Carter bonds, the United States Treasury issued out bonds that were due back in German marks and Swiss francs. And that was the only way that they could really do it and keep it and get the interest rates that they uh, that they needed at the time. So this is what a lot of foreign countries do now is they issue out their bonds, their sovereign bonds that are due in a U.S. dollar. And doesn't have anything to do with the United States. Doesn't have anything to do with our banks or corporations or government or nothing. So this is a very common thing. Offshore bonds. You know? um, China's China corporations like the the property developers like Evergrande, they they suffered dramatically big with this when the dollar started to strengthen against the yuan. The corporations, these property developers, couldn't come up with enough of their own currency to buy the dollars to pay back their debts, and they started failing. The the dollar dollar denominated debts that these Chinese corporations had issued out these corpor these uh, property developers, they started going into default. And the problem with that is, is that even though it was just a small scale of the overall debt that they had, these dollar bonds, the bigger debt that they had was done in yuan but the problem really came is that when that when those dollar bonds began to default that is like the the gold standard form and if those start to default the rest of the credit rating that they have on all the on all the rest of their sovereign bonds you know their their local currency their onshore bonds they start suffering with their credit rating loss so if they can't pay the dollars back they're probably not going to be paying the yuan back and then their credit rating goes to hell together. So even though it was just a small portion of it, it was the most important portion. Any money you spend is tax deductible on your 1099 of your corporate self. See, that's the other thing. Like a lot of people really understand that part of it too. Like, I don't know. Uh, you gain any insight from Peter Schiff? Do I gain? Um, well... You know, I think probably, um, you know, I've listened to Peter so much that I really got a good idea of what his economic theory is. And so, like, when I listen to Peter and I hear him talk, it's pretty much what I would in, in, what I would have expected out of him. Like, you know, these are some of the some of the things. I guess probably like the biggest takeaway that I took away from that conversation is when we started getting into the digital gold. Like, he really liked the idea or at least was more in favor of the idea of using a gold-backed digital token as opposed to like a Bitcoin or central bank digital currency. And that with a gold-backed digital token, you could really have a gold standard of sorts that could be used just as easily as any kind of debit card or anything else. The only thing, I didn't bring it up to him, but the only thing that I have a problem with that is, is that you're still reliant on the third party. Right. And just like the goldsmiths back in the day who issued out a hell of a lot more paper than they actually have gold for, that gives these entities out there who are doing this gold, you know, backed token the ability to issue out a hell of a lot more tokens than they have the gold to back it up with. Now, granted, there could be auditing mechanisms and all kinds of stuff to make sure that it is what they say it is. I'm just saying it leaves a little too much room for corruption to happen within that kind of system when you're reliant upon the third party, especially when it comes to gold, which is supposed to not have that third party to be reliant on. Right? So I guess if there was one part of that, that that I really took a lot from, it was that, you know, that was one of the uh, one of the parts that I really kind of thought about after we had uh, had the conversations. So. Peter's a great dude. I mean, he was he, it was really cool of Peter to take the time to actually come on my channel. I mean, he didn't have to do that. And I I don't think he really was prepared to talk to me for a whole hour. I just kind of just said I'm just going to do this. And you have to think, like, you know, Peter's pretty, pretty up there, right? I mean, the dude's got a lot of money. And he works a lot. And so you can imagine how much an hour of his time is worth. Like, an hour of his time is worth more than my whole year. Right. I mean, he probably is an hour of his time is like a hundred thousand dollars. Right. So I took that. Like, I mean, he, he, he let me, he let me, I mean, we talked for an hour, 
but that is a lot to give up, you know, for, you know, for somebody like me. And I tell you, man, I really appreciate it. He didn't have to come on my channel and he didn't have to take the opportunity to, you know, to share his, share his information and, you know, stuff like that with me. Um, I mean, I can't thank him enough for it. It was like one of the, one of the coolest moments of this channel and like one of the neatest people I think I've ever got the chance to talk to. So I'm really, you know, I'm, it's like, it was a proud moment for me. You know? All right. Uh, composite operator. Thanks you very much for the 20 tech workers have lost their jobs this year. And this just the beginning. If you live close to a tech city, you might get a good price on some houses. If you put out a bid, you know, that is, is very true you know that's that's the type of thing like you know you really have to be thinking about is like if you really want a good deal on a house where would the best prices of these houses be well it's going to be where people get on um, you know lose their jobs you know end up going on unemployment and those particular areas are going to have more of the chances of finding the foreclosures or people who are trying to get out of those houses at a lot cheaper price like that's a good strategy to take on it's just like man where are these un unemployment people unemployed people gonna be i'm gonna go grab one of their houses right i mean divorce death or destitution that's what you're looking for thank you again for the uh for the 20 there composite operator really appreciate that peter shift taught have taught me over the last 20 years that a broken clock can be correct twice every 24 cycles okay well yeah, I mean, if making predictions, like I'm not going to, I'm going to try not to do it anymore. Like making predictions is just nothing but, you know, just creates you a bunch of havoc and people just tell you how wrong you are. Um, that's cool. Like, I mean, you know, you can't really do this job without actually having some sort of predictions involved with it. But, you know, when you're predicting stuff, you're also predicting it on the conditions that you are experiencing at the time that they are. So when Peter makes a prediction or when I make a prediction or when all, any economist makes a prediction, they're, they're making those predictions off of the current environment the way they are. So in a year from now, when everything has changed and our predictions didn't come true or maybe we have changed them or something like that, people are like, hey, you got it wrong, right? You, didn't, you, 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 you called it wrong. And it was just like, well, no, the environment changed and we didn't see some of the tools that were going to be coming from the federal reserve like special purpose vehicles right i mean did anybody take that into their strategy from the federal reserve prior to the pandemic did anybody it was just like so when the pandemic kicks in and the federal reserve and the treasury set up the special purpose vehicles they're going to bail out the corporations and all the people and allow forbearance to happen anybody take that into their strategy prior to 2020 i mean i don't i can't find a single article or talk of special purpose vehicles prior to the establishment of them. So if anybody had that as part of their strategy that was going to come from the Federal Reserve and their tools that they can use, I would love to talk with that person because nobody had that idea ahead of time. I mean, there might have been somebody, but they weren't talking about it on the news and they weren't writing blogs about it. And if they did, I didn't see it. And I don't think anybody else did either. So this is the reason why like making predictions for an economist is almost impossible to do because the environment is not going to be the same coming into the future. Like if you ever, ever heard me say it, or even a lot of other economists say it, what they will say before they make a prediction, if this continues, unless things change, unless, you know, if, you know, if something can, you know, happens or it doesn't happen or whatever, like you hear that kind of statement coming from them that's their excuse because they know nothing is ever going to stay the same all right so i even do it myself if this environment continues the way it is then this is going to eventually happen right but then it doesn't happen because the environment doesn't stay the same and it changes right it gets conditions change you know federal reserve you know switches position or something like that and everybody's perception of what's going on completely shifts and then you know everything becomes different so that's why, like, you know, Peter Schiff and a lot of other guys, when they make these predictions, yeah, they end up being wrong a lot because they're making predictions off of the way the current environment is. And a lot of people is like, okay, well, we're going to lock you into that prediction and then pretend like the environment didn't change when, you know, when the time comes. <laughs> and then just call you out for being wrong. 
If you listen to his podcast, he's made a lot of wrong calls and he realizes it. So he become more vague in his predictions over the last year. Well, yeah, it's because, you know, when you call it out as bad as as big as it is, like, you know, you say that, man, we are going to have a total market collapse crash. Get your money out of the bank today. How many times have you seen a YouTuber put that on their on their thumbnail? You know, with a big old like, you know, kind of face going along with it or some shit. You know, this is the type of, like, I don't do that. Like, I am not the type of person who's going to be like, get your money out of the bank today. In fact, I told people, like, you know, I keep all my money in the bank. In fact, I try to because that's where you want it. In case you want to get a loan later on, you have to have proof that you have this money. If you just have cash sitting there and you throw it into the bank, they're going to be like, where the hell did you get all this cash? So you don't want to have to like, you know, question where your money comes from. But if you don't have it in the bank, you can't do that. And there were so many YouTubers out there saying, get your money out of the bank before you lose it all to a bank run, you know? And I'm thinking, well, who the hell is scared of a bank run? Like, why in the world would, a, would an economist in this environment right now, the way the banking system is, tell people to get their money out of the bank today or else you'll lose it next week or something like that? Like... Where the hell did they come up with this? This is like, like, what in the world? Like, what are you thinking? I, I don't, I don't get it. Like, I can get it for like the entertainment factor of it. I can get it for the fear factor of it, and I can get it like you can take a little piece of information that might have some sort of factual, you know, realism to it, and then blow it way out of proportion. Yeah, you know, I can see all that stuff happening. But as far as like, you know, an actual legitimate like prediction for you to get your money out of the bank before the world comes crashing down who does that like i mean unless you're just trying to get views or sell you on something right i mean that's it's a it's garbage all right so yarn brooks himself has said that if you want your money to be safe put it in the bank that will get bailed out by the government I wouldn't want to have my money in the bank if I think it's going to need to be bailed out. Okay? So, I'm, I'm, no. That's, I don't think that's a good way of going about it. This is a terrible strategy. I'm sorry. Right? I mean, that might be, you know, their strategy, but that's a terrible strategy to go with. I want to be so economically aware that I have confidence with my money being in the bank. If I don't, then I'm not going to keep my money in the bank. Right? So this is the difference that I think a lot of people are just like they're hoping and wishing that it does or maybe finding it. I No, that's not the way it goes down, right? The current economic environment should be telling you exactly what you need to do and you should intuitively just know the right way to go about it because you study the economy that much. Um, if you think that keeping your money in the bank and using somebody else's suggestion that a bailout might rescue your money, ugh. I mean, that's, that's, I mean, I'm not trying to knock a strategy, man, but that's not me. I'm not doing it that way. Yeah. Uh, no more government bailouts. It will be equity holders and creditors in the U.S. Bail-in is a potential. I would put money in more places and some in my safe just in case. Exactly. He keeps bringing up that. From 1800 to 1914, prices of goods went down. Are you talking? About, okay. So from 1800 to 1914, there was a lot more trade that was starting to happen during that time. I mean, you got to think about it. The United States was operating up in that time. You know, there was a lot more happening here. There was a lot more commerce and shipping and stuff like that happening. So when you have a lot more commerce and you have a limited amount of currency that's out there, right? There's only so much gold to go around. Gold and silver was it. And so when you only have so much gold and silver to go around and you have a lot more business taking place, but not a lot more currency to fill in for that business, then guess what happens? There's less money to go around. That means prices have to go down in order to facilitate the trade. That's the reason why a lot of times a lot of... When the Federal Reserve was established, they were established as a elastic money supply. So pretty much what happens is, is that during the business cycle, as things start to ramp up, right, and more business is taking place and more commerce and more people and whatever, 
then what ends up happening is you have a concentration of wealth, right? As you're doing more business, you start saving your money or whatever, and you start concentrating a lot of this wealth. Well, there's only so much gold out there to be used for currency. And as you concentrate this wealth, less money is available for commerce out there. And eventually you have a collapse of the business cycle and then all that money gets redistributed out. And then you have the whole thing happen again, right? So this was the business cycle. And I mean, it was, it was well aware of, I mean, everybody knew about it, right? And the only problem with it is, is that people weren't preparing themselves for this business cycle. So they would be like during the good times, they would just spend all their money. And then during the bad times, they would go broke. And there was these devastating events that would happen as people would, you know, these booms and bust cycles would happen. So the Federal Reserve was sold as an elastic money supply. So when the economy started to heat up and then this concentration of money started flowing into just a few hands during these, you know, increasing in the business cycle, the Federal Reserve would start adding money to the system to try and expand the money supply while the economy was getting hot, right? That would expand the money supply, make sure that there was plenty of currency out there to make sure the commerce continued on. If the economy slowed down, they would start extracting the money back out of the supply, decreasing the money supply, so this would be like part of the business cycle. There wouldn't be as much booms and busts taking place. But it failed, it didn't work, right? So now what do we have? We have a situation in which that we have a debt cycle instead, and when the debt, becomes too big they have to increase the interest rates and then hopefully kind of bring the debt cycle back down and then once ever the debt comes down and everybody loses a bunch of their you know businesses or homes or whatever is happening out there you get a bunch of defaults you know clearing out of the bad debt then they can turn it around and you know increase the money supply again and start you know getting more people to to take out loans to buy houses and cars and stuff like that so it switched from like a business cycle and then trying to deal with the business cycle the booms and busts of a business cycle has then now turned into like trying to deal with the booms and busts of credit cycles and it's a much different different environment you know so you know during those times the 1800 to 1914 yeah there was like, unless you were mining a hell of a lot more gold, you had more commerce, more people were being born, more factories were being developed, more commerce was taking place and therefore you needed more money. And if you didn't have more money, like more gold, then what happens? Like if the gold supply stays steady, but you have more commerce, well, then you have to lower your prices in order to get some of that money. And that's really why prices had gone down between the 1800s and 1914 and then pretty much gone the other way ever since, you know? How long have I been out here? Two hours and 40 minutes. Amazing, man. All right. Soon we will have an addition to what is being American. And the question will be, can I pay my MasterCard with my Visa card? <laughs> uh, I've invested all my money. Oh, wait a minute. We've already been there. Okay. A uh, social contract has been broken. He sticks purely to an Austrian economic view of the world and money it is much more a political construct today. And it's government governed by human passions, not rule of law. Uh, uh, deflation is a good thing. Indentured is like a computer code. It dictates and documents what has to happen china and iran what to stop sell in dollars want uh, want to stop sales in dollars yeah and that's fine so let me ask you something china buys a bunch of uh, iranian oil all right china buys this iranian oil to give iran a bunch of yuan now iran is going to do what with their yuan other than go back to china right and they might go to russia right I mean, what are they going to get from Russia? Russia will take Chinese yuan. Who else? Maybe India. India might take some too. But that's it. Now they got four trading partners that they can they can play around with, with their yuan. Now, if they had dollars, everybody would play. Everybody will be accepting their dollars. But they're they're playing with this other currency. So well, how is that going to work out for them in the end? Right? I'm not saying that it's not happening. It's happening, and they are doing it. But it is such a small amount. It is just a tiny little fraction of the overall oil sales that are actually happening in the world. That is it actually going to do anything to impact the dollar dominance, the petrodollar? Yeah, maybe over time. I mean, it's certainly you know shown its 
shown its character of being able to do something like that, but it is so far away from being able to actually kick the dollar off of that that it isn't happening yet. They're trying it, but it's not very prominent, should I say? Like, you know, this is the way it's going to go. Like, I don't see that happening. They're just making deals, and they're small at that. Uh, your dollar is more important. So isn't that a good thing to have slow deflation over time, over the centuries? I think we have better standard of living now, despite the government and the Fed making things worse. Well, yeah, we definitely have a better standard of living, but that's due to the technology advances that we see. It's certainly not due to the fact that the Federal Reserve and the government are doing anything about it. Now, as far as wouldn't deflation be good over time? No. It wouldn't. Can you imagine buying a house and then having it sell for less than what you paid for it? Right? Can you imagine having a retirement that doesn't get anything as far as a increase in interest? Like you just the money you put in there, that's all it gets. Like it's just the money you save. Never increases with an interest rate or anything like that. So imagine that kind of environment. Like I'm not saying it's a bad one, because like, you know, if you saved enough to buy a loaf of bread today and in fifty years be able to take that same amount of money and still be out be able to buy a loaf of bread bread that's pretty cool all right or even better yet buy two loaves of bread with the same amount of money now that is a pretty cool environment to be in if you are able to save and have that kind of thing but what if you're into assets and buying assets like houses and stocks and all that other stuff and you don't have an inflationary environment but a deflationary environment well then everything that you invest in would actually pay you less back than what you are buying right now does that sound fun like you know, you better pick out the right business to, to invest in because it's not so much about the inflation over time that everything just kind of swells in price. You are actually having to be like invested with the correct company that is going to profit on their own and not just, you know, succeed because you happen to be in an inflationary environment. Um, yeah, I think a deflationary environment would be a much better place to be in, especially for individuals who really understand it. But for people who don't understand it, like 95% of the entire world, they're going to have to be in an inflationary environment because they just don't know how to deal with their life in a proper fashion, right? They have to be able to put money towards a retirement that just magically grows, you know, or put it in towards a house that just going to go, that's just going to constantly increase in value, right? This is the type of environment that people are used to and that they are expecting. So, yeah, deflation would be great for the saver, you know, but for everybody else in the world, they don't know how to deal with that. They want to see things go up bike like magic, you know, and um, how high will inflation stay or last for four years? I don't know. Like, I don't think I, I honestly in two years from now, I don't think anybody's going to even talk about inflation anymore. It'll be like the last thing on their mind. They're going to be more worried about like uh, how they come up with their dinner, you know. Um, consumers want deflation. Producers want inflation. Yeah. That's a good way of putting it. All right. Let's see. No, because people get into the mindset that they should just save their money and don't invest in and consume. Yeah. And that's the problem is that actually people do think that is that they should just save their money. And if you save your money for any length of time, like, you know, you save your money for 10 years, you've lost. You've lost out a lot on that, no matter what you do. You have, if you're going to save your money, you have to be strategic about it. You have to be in a position in which that you feel that there is going to be cheaper assets going into the future, much like we are sitting right now. Like I feel that being in cash is the only place that, that I feel comfortable being because there's so many chances for asset prices to come down, especially when you're looking at things like the stock market. I mean, yeah, we had a huge rally in it, you know, what was it yesterday or whatever, but some of the biggest single day rallies happen during a bear market. So I wouldn't get excited about seeing, you know, a particular day where the stocks do really well. The overall environment for the next few years is going to be very difficult on stocks as the Federal Reserve continues to keep their interest rates elevated and keeping the consumer like, you know, away from the market. And then on top of that, hurting the un or hurting the employment of it or the working person. So this isn't necessarily like a place that, you know, is going to be like 
awesome for investment purposes. I just don't see it. Like, not for the next year, two maybe. All right. Uh, fiat is not scarce. Nope, it's not. All right. I'm getting like almost 4% for sitting on my money in a money market cash and inflation is like seven, not bad for risk-free cash and waiting for the crash. Yeah. I mean, it is, and especially like a money market account, cause you can just pull the money right back out again. But even still, like I think about it, you know, you get a 4% return on your money. Let's just take something really simple, like a thousand dollars, right? So you got a thousand dollars, you're going to get a 4% return on it over a year. That means you're going to get like 40 bucks. All right. You're going to get 40 bucks for your 4% return on a thousand dollars. And now I think about it, like, would I really want to earn $40 on my thousand dollars or would I rather just have the thousand dollars ready to deploy at any moment, right? Would it be worth to keep, keep the thousand dollars and not earn the 40 bucks for that, for that short amount of time? Or would it be better to earn the $40, you know, in weight? That's, that's, kind of the the spot that I'm at right now when I think about it. It's like the timeline isn't long enough for me to earn an interest on the money to keep it in a money market account, even at 4% or 5%. It's like, it's just not enough. If it was 10 years of that, then yeah, that would be something different. That would be, that would be something I would consider, but not for a year. Like to me, it's not enough reward for the risk of tying it up for a year. Um, yeah, but that's just me. I mean, other people are like, nope, I want my 40 bucks for nothing. And that's totally cool because that's the way you invest, right? You, you know, try to get a return on it. But I think the investment opportunity is greater than the definite return by holding on to your money as opposed to investing it. They are planning a 2024 bust or work. Uh, uh, but your money is essentially safe. I am saving a lot of money because I have a ton of real estate and it keeps up with inflation and produces cash flow. Yeah. If I didn't have assets, I would be getting rid of my money as fast as possible. And if you did, what would you be getting into that you feel would not be going down into the future? I am on high living. Everything is getting more expensive in a few months. Waiting for the housing market to get lots of flips. I hold the cash over the interest in this environment. Saving money makes only banks rich. Agree, UE. Don't think of it as about earning 40 bucks think about it as not losing 80 or at least only losing 40 with an eight percent inflationary rate okay no that's absolutely true that is that is that is a great way of, of thinking about it because you will you'll lose your money if you hold on to it and as opposed to spending it right now so if that's the case like i mean i agree with that right if you if you don't want to lose the I mean, the, if you don't want to earn the $40 and if you don't want to think about it like that, think about it as not losing 80% or $80 due to the inflation loss of purchasing power from it. Now, if that's what you're taking on for a consideration, you're still in a loss, right? Because even though you're going to lose $80 for the purchasing power, but you're gaining $40 of actual interest, so you're actually out $40. But the point is, is that you still lost by doing this, right? no matter what. So by that theory, you should have just spent your money to begin with and not saved it at all. So I, again, like I would rather hold on to the thousand dollars with the anticipation that I'm going to be buying an asset that is going down in price, not losing my purchasing power. I'm not going to buy items with this, like the things that I need with my life. You know, if that was the case, then I should just purchase those things today instead of waiting. But if you're holding this thousand dollars to buy an asset that's going down in price, then you're not losing to an inflationary environment because you're not purchasing items with it. You're purchasing an investment. You, you see the difference in it? It's like if you were saying, okay, I have this thousand dollars because I'm going to use it to live on, right? Well then buy the things that you need today. So you don't lose it to an inflationary loss, right? The loss of purchasing power. But if you you're thinking, no, I don't want to buy it today. 
I want to hold on to it, but I don't want to lose this purchasing power. Well, then you have to go and put it in this 4% return and then lose only $40 from inflation over time. Now, if, to me, none of that makes sense, right? But if you're holding on to $1,000 and you're going to say, hey, I'm going to buy an asset that is going to go down in price. That's what I am looking for. Then there, you don't lose purchasing power because you're not purchasing something that's like, you know, something you need. You're going for a particular asset that is going to lose price or lose value or become cheaper or whatever. So that's like the major difference that I see. Like if you're holding on to this money because you plan on living with it, like you're planning on consuming with it, then yeah, you need to find some place to have a return on that so you don't lose your purchasing power. But if you're going to invest it, then there's no point in investing that money into something that's going to have a 4% return if you're tying your money up. Like, I don't know. To me, that's like, that's the way I'm doing it. Like, I'm not looking for the environment to have a thousand dollars to buy my consumable items with. That's not it. I'm looking for the investment. I'm looking for the good price deal. Easy bugs. You go easy bugs. I ain't eating bugs. Unless you dip them in chocolate, then I might eat it. All right. Uh, anything that locks up funds has to be beating the 3.5 FDIC insured and fully flexible by wide enough margin to justify the lockup. Yeah. If you could buy a productive asset, then it makes sense to spend it. To buy something you're going to consume, I'm not sure. All right, dark chocolate, for sure. Definitely dark chocolate. All right. Um, there are no good deals to be purchased. There will be. I'm glad you did. It's funny, I was already investing, and I come to know those five myself before I heard it on any podcast. Then around 2017 to 2018, a lot of people started saying it. What are you guys talking about? Uh not if you rent to relatives who can't pay full rent. <laughs> uh, you guys are all talking here. Um, so no matter during where you bought in the market cycle, even if property values went down, you can still be paid up for your paid up to four ways. Oh, gosh, what what time is it here? Wow, two hours and 55 minutes I've been out here. My gosh, guys, how much power do I have left? I got about 20% of my phone. All right, (laughs) we were typing about the five ways REI pays out. Oh, the real estate investment? Yeah. And see, that's kind of another thing that I thought about. It's like people were like, man, you should invest in real estate. And I was like, why don't you just invest in a real estate investment trust? Then you don't have to do anything. You just like, you know, just make the purchase, uh, have the asset. But, oh, I don't know. All righty, guys. I think I'm going to bail out. It's been a long time that we've hung out here. And you guys are so awesome. 267 of you, 288 likes. $148 in Super Chats. You guys are always just so supportive of the channel. I just couldn't tell you how much I appreciate that. All right. It's like having guns and keeping bullets to load the gun in the case you need to use it for any reason instead of locking them up so it's difficult to get to them when the emergency happens. Yeah, that's actually a good way of talking about it. It was just like, you know, I got this here gun for home defense, but I got the bullets, like, you know, it's locked up someplace where I can't get to them just in case, you know, something bad happens. I don't want to, like, you know, be responsible for, you know, this gun going off and not having any bullets near it. So what good is the gun, right? There's no point in having a gun anymore if you don't have any bullets for it. All right. Uh, you should see Canadian gun storage laws. You know, I mean... We already have some pretty stupid ones here in Oregon. What are you renting? A closet? Let me see here. Thanks, UE. It's been fun chatting. Yeah, it's been really awesome having you guys here. And it's always fun, you know, seeing some of the comments. I love it when you guys agree, and I love it when you disagree because, you know, this is the way the conversation goes. Try to figure out, 
you know, what it is that we need to do with our lives in order to uh, conduct it to the best of our abilities, you know, to become as profitable, profitable as we can to, um, you know, to see those uh, investments as confidently as we do. This is the whole point of this channel is to figure this stuff out. And, um, you know, I can't thank you guys enough for being here. I mean, you know, hung out with me for three hours, 254 of you right now, 295 likes. You guys went and hit that like button just towards the end here. I really appreciate that. So, All right. I'm going to read one more from all nighter here. Only the untrained leave their firearms unloaded, making a making for more steps when under stress. You know, you're right about you're right about that. Um, you know, all nighter. Um, all my firearms are unloaded, but not one. <laughs> one of them's not. You know. So, I agree to disagree. Well, absolutely. I mean, that's the whole point. Like, if you if you're just sitting around watching, you know, confirming bias. I mean, then what's the point? You know, I mean, you. I mean, that's one of the part of this channel is that I've I've really tried to do is try to come up with like logical ideas and theories that is completely different from everybody else's. And sometimes I have to play like the devil's advocate to try and get the conversation going out there, but never do I just make stuff up. Like I really do try to find, you know, the information out there that supports my theories and the things that I see going on. Um, you know, I mean, nobody can predict the future. We all learned that, you know, a long time ago, but we can all kind of do things to conduct our lives to be the most profitable we can. And, um, you know, again, that's what this whole thing is all about. So if you want to agree with everybody, then you may not find some information that you need, but, you know, being in a, being in a conversation where it's somewhat disagreeable, then yeah, you get to, you know, throw the ideas around and really kind of take in ideas and maybe, you know, thoughts that you never had before and either confirm or change what you believe. That's the whole point of the whole thing, you know? All right. I could stay out here with you guys all day, but I got to go. I'm going to go home, hang out with the kids for a little bit. I guess they, uh, they went up to the Portland zoo to, uh, see the lights. They do a light kind of show all over the Portland Zoo, so you walk around and you have like all this light light display thing going on. It's pretty cool, I guess. We went up to it a couple of years ago, and it was a lot of fun. Um, so anyway, they're up there doing that today, and yeah, I'm gonna go home and make dinner. All right, uneducated economist, you guys let me know.